the people here. I'm going to call the uh, meeting of the Hamilton Winona Regional School District of July 2nd to order. Um, in the absence of our chair, I'm going to call it. Uh, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, first order of business is going to be the approval of the warrants. So, we're going to take a little audio break.
All right, uh, we're back, and now we will open the floor for any citizen comments. If you can step up to the microphone and then state your name and address. Hi, my name is Marissa Politas. Um, I'm representing the myself and the neighbors of uh, Beach Street and Lakeshore Drive, um, that's off of Forest Street, in reference to removal of bus stops on bus 12. Um, all of the parents um, have written letters or called and made comments that we think that the new bus stop and combining the bus stops as they are have been very unsafe. And we're not, it also causes our children to walk a quarter mile. Um, some of them are very young as it's elementary school. And we think that the new bus stop is not going to adequately serve the children, as well as it being very unsafe. This morning there was a situation where there's almost 11 kids now at that bus stop. It's further away and people are having to drive and it's becoming quite a, a problem. Um, Ajit dropped off his daughter this morning and the bus driver, and he said it was a mess, and the bus driver had asked him if he could even go further up the street on Gregory Island Road. So I guess the questions are, when we wrote the emails and the complaints, the first thing is, what was the start of this bus stop change? What led to removal of these bus stop changes so that we can understand that? Um, secondly, the process didn't involve any of the parents. And so we are concerned that there's a process in place that did not consult us nor take our comments or concerns in a public space. Um, where we felt that we were taken seriously or being considered. And then thirdly, to address the safety issues that we see and to go over that there was, uh, there was an assessment done of the bus stops that did not represent any third party that was not from the school board or from the bus company. It didn't involve any of the parents. And so we feel that that was an unfair way to do an assessment on something that affected our children. Um, does anyone have anything to add? <laughs> um, My name is Ajit Pillai. Uh, I live at 133 Lakeshore Ave. Um, there was multiple bus stops in the initial uh, notice which were removed, but for some reason it was restored. And one bus stop which will be restored is more dangerous than what our bus stop is. So we don't even know the logic behind why our bus stops have been removed when this bus stop has been restored, which has a slope when it is backing off. So uh, it doesn't make any logic of why this, all the stops which has been there for 25 years been removed and that too in between the school year, not the beginning of the school year or you know, giving adequate uh, notice it's true that we got three weeks notice. But we are all working parents. Uh, there is no it's way. It's also three weeks in December, which I don't know if you guys realize, for parents of young children is a really difficult time to start rechanging the week after vacation to come up with a new schedule and new things, particularly if you have younger siblings that you're also managing daycare and all of that other stuff. Um, so. You also are basically putting, I think, like 11 families or something like that onto Forest Street in the middle of, basically everyone down there is commuting, right? So basically, suddenly you have a backup of multiple, multiple cars right in the middle of Forest Street, right at an intersection when people are commuting for work. So I don't know how in the world someone thought that that was going to be safer than breaking them up into smaller areas that are a little bit more kind of set apart. The other thing is, what, what was the impetus for this change? Where's the data backing it up? Uh, you know, that we haven't seen any of that. We heard a story about basically the assistant superintendent and two assistants going for a ride with someone from Salter. That doesn't sound, that, there's really no information there, right? So was there anyone aside from Salter who has an interest in obviously trimming down the number of stops? Was there anyone along that, that has any information there? I mean, as, aside from them? We'd like to know why it's unsafe, because right now it's a lot more unsafe than it was. So, excuse me, did um, you just give us your name and address oh, for the record? 54 Thanks. Beach Street. Hi. <laughs> so I guess we'll take down the discussion. Uh, no. Oh, no. 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 Oh, 
No. No, this no. isn't a discussion. All right, so we're not posted to actually discuss uh, this at the moment, but um, you know, we have heard your, your complaint, and I, <coughs> you know, I had seen the up, um, email updates on the um, bus stop itself, but I will make sure that we get a letter out to you guys uh, explaining the situation um, better, you know, to your, to your liking more to figure out what's going on. Can you also forward that information to the school committee too, because I don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's the first time I've heard of it. Yeah, well. If you can forward some information, that would be great to sure. us too. Oh. So, one of the things that I see driving here right now. Yes, yes. So, one of the things that I thought was very strange about the updates that we had received was we were told that the stop at Village Lane and and Forest um, Street was unsafe. And I had highlighted in my email that one of the reasons why I like my kids being at that stop is that there is a curb and a six foot grassy area with trees that is cleared. It even has a little round group of stones and a fence that bars it from the neighbor's property. At the new bus stop, there is the kids ride their bikes or their scooters up, they park them in this area on the grass, and they, for the most part, are off the road in this they very large space for them. Happen. There's five young <laughs> kids, fifth grade and under, at that stop. At the new stop, there is a telephone pole, a wooded area, and the neighbors on the other side all have their gardens right up to the street, and there's no sidewalk. And it's at the intersection that comes around a corner. I don't even know this is an operation where they're saying that that is more safe versus what we had before, which was an isolated area that they could stand off the street. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, this is an operations issue. This, so some of, I know, um, at least one of the, the parents here has contacted me directly, um, but that's what you should be doing is actually coming to me with this. So the issue came to me I'm the assistant superintendent. Um, and then if it's the chain of command is that if it can't be resolved through me, then the next step, and right. as your wife and I communicated, both in person and written email, right. um, the next step in the chain of command would be to, to meet with the superintendent and myself. Should be coming to me. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, at this point, I've, we've heard your concerns, and um, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent have known that you're here, and obviously have expressed that we should be speaking directly with the superintendent um, in trying to resolve this. So, in you know, we'll we'll end this discussion here, but Is there a sure, sure. But you know, at the same time, we you know we'll be moving on because this is an operations issue and, and not a Okay. School. Well, my name's Lauren Kennedy. I also live on Village Lane and I'm at the same um, bus stop at the top of Village Lane. I would just like to echo the concern that the new bus stop literally has nowhere for the kids to wait. The bus comes at the same time as people are commuting out to the commuter rail. There's a lot of cars up and down the street in the corner of the two roads where the kids are meant to wait in the street because there's nowhere else for them to wait but in the street is where all the other cars from the crossroad come down and around, literally driving through you know, and around the kids where they have absolutely nowhere to wait in between two streets, busy streets. So. Thank you, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, do we have any other citizens' comments? So the next step is, would be to definitely um, get in touch with Dr. Harvey. Right. Um, if you want to send him an email and CC me, you know, feel free to. Um, and you know, again, we'll, you know, and I, I, I'd be expecting, and this would be the rest of the school committee, um, a response to you guys to actually try and at least satisfy 
your curiosity of what, you know, why the decision was made and, mm -hmm. and, and what was happening and you know, how we're gonna move forward with this. Jeff Sands, right there, is the person you want. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, the next step on the agenda is the chair's report. Um, I actually don't have anything to report today. So. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? Stay. We on to me? On to you. Okay. Uh, first off, I uh, just want to let the committee members know I've been invited to attend the uh, Hamilton Board of Selectmen meeting next Monday. Um, I assume the, the agenda is budget because it's that time of year. So. Um, and I don't know if Gene said he was going to try to attend, but I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. And anybody else want to join us? <laughs> what time? Monday at 7? Monday at 7? Okay. Here? Around. No, over at uh, Hamilton <laughs> Town Hall. we we'll change the venue for you. Makes it more intriguing. All right. Um, and then the other uh, announcement is that the uh, Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents is uh, going to hold a series of meetings, actually just one meeting, on a state aid funding, on the state aid funding formula. Uh, and the Association of School Superintendents is calling on state lawmakers to address the grave inequities in the state's funding formula for public education, uh, to bring attention to the financial cliff school systems statewide are fast approaching. Uh, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents will hold three public forums across the state. The, all of those will be on Tuesday, January 8th. Uh, the forums will begin at 6 p.m. and will feature panel discussions uh, with state and local educational leaders. And these forums are open to the public. Um, the uh, fo lo local forum uh, for our area will be at Malden High School, uh, downtown Malden. So that's where Education Center's. <laughs> that's where the Desi is too. So yes. Uh, so that's. Um, what date is that? That's Tuesday. What did I say Tuesday the 8th at 6 o'clock at Malden High School. And those are the announcements. <coughs> All right, next we're gonna move on to the consent agenda. So were you gonna talk about the North Shore Education Consortium? Oh, I'm before, sorry, I missed that. Sorry, it slipped, it slipped off my list. So there's, this is the uh, annual report from the uh, North Shore Education Consortium. It's uh, kind of uh, appropriate that we're talking about out-of-district placements tonight. This is one of uh, our out-of-district uh, providers. And uh, as you can see through the, uh, the piece, I'm a member of the board of directors of the consortium uh, because of my position. And as a requirement of our membership, we need to share the annual report with the school committee every year. So you have... Uh, a copy in your packet. Is there anything notable that you wanted us to see? No, actually, it's it's pretty much the the typical report. Um, I was just going to look. There usually is a graph on where their students come from. We actually don't have a large number of students there. Yeah, there was a graph. On yeah, there is a graph in there. I can't find it. Mm -hmm. You could actually just ask Stacy. <laughs> See if she knows. It's on page 21. That far away? Oh, oh no, that's, that's not no, it. It was no. like a Sorry, multiple yeah. bar graph. It was online, I saw it, but it doesn't so look like it's in the it. packet here. Oh, here it is. Post right. Page 8 Thank you. of the packet, page 7 of the report. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're roughly the same size as Ipswich, and we have maybe double the kids attending. Yeah, the number's around 15. Ipswich, I think, has around 10. Right. Ipswich just joined, actually, as a full member of okay. this, this year. That was one of those that well. we approved recently. So right. we're at 15 on here. It's hard to tell exactly. Uh, that sound right, Stacey? 15. Does that sound right? Yeah. 
it's a bar graph and it's, it's not quite 20, but it's more than 10. So. Now on to the consent agenda. Uh, the so it's just report. the two town reports for Hamilton and Wenham's uh, annual report books. Okay, can, before we do that, can, we, can I ask you a question about the minutes? Yes. Are you still, the secretary is still reviewing the minutes, yeah, from the last few sessions? Yeah, we, I haven't seen them. You haven't seen them. Okay. Yeah. I haven't. The minutes have not come, and I've questioned Mike. Like, I can't get a hold of this the person doing the Mahala. minutes. So, yep. Mahala. Okay. Yeah, she emailed me t uh, about an hour ago and s said she was sick and wasn't yeah. able to attend tonight. Um, the, so the email also said she was planning on getting the, the outstanding minutes sets this yeah, week. I've been asking for them. Okay. All right. Thanks. Quite a while, and like, we need to get up on it. <laughs> yeah. And so. It hasn't that I didn't try sometimes not even gain a reply nope, back. We've so. been trying. <laughs> I think Mike had a call. Yeah. No replies. Donna called her too. <laughs> yep. Okay. I move that the Hamilton Wenham Regional School Committee accept the town 2018 reports as is. There can be no changes. Second. All those in favor? Oh, unanimous. <clears throat> All right. So on to new business. Um, gonna start the budget discussion. There's one up there, you're staying here. Gonna do uh, an intro or just jump right into it? Yeah, we can do a quick, quick intro. We have a quick intro. Hold on a second. Of course, I went to sleep. Probably. I have that up. Huh? I have that. And right. then you have. Right. And then I have theirs too. Okay. So I'll give a quick update. Uh, we've got several presentations on tap for this evening. Um, our, our initial recommendation was presented to the committee on December 19th, a couple weeks ago before the holiday break. Uh, so just a quick, uh, quick recap. Um, to catch you all back up on where we left off. Mike, if you, yeah, there you go. So uh, a quick uh, budget process overview. Um, we're in month four of the budget process. Uh, the process started in October um, with uh, certification of E&D, uh, building tools, those kinds of things. Uh, went through November and December. Uh, Finance committee meeting number one uh, critical priorities assessment and in, uh, internally fixed and variable cost reviews. Uh, we updated our five-year capital plan project list uh, and then we finalized and presented our, our, our superintendent's budget recommendation to you all a couple weeks ago. We're now in the January time frame here, this first red box. Uh, so we'll, uh, for the next several weeks, go through uh, significant amount of detail with respect to Special Ed. Uh, I'll give a pretty detailed presentation on uh, OHEV and our recommendation in that space, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, the five year capital plan project list. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into another series of presentations at our next meeting on the 16th, and then on the 30th, and then again uh, on the 13th of February. Um, you can go forward, Mike. Uh, so, again, just a quick recap. Uh, what what the recommendation is, it's level service budget plus uh, funding for an OPEB uh, trust fund plus funding for a school resource officer, uh, which amounts to a level service plus OPEB plus SRO into a $1.975 million uh, increase over the current year budget or 6.2%. So again, just a quick recap on the major categories and the growth. Salary savings with respect to 
state and the, how we've gotten here over the last five years. Um, we'll also talk about OPEC trust fund, $250,000 number, and then the $73,000 number, which is associated with uh, the recommendation about um, uh, the school resource officer implementation. You can roll forward, Mike. There we go. So at this point, I'll uh, hand the mic over to Chief Stevens, Chief Perkins, and Captain DiNapoli um, to make a presentation about school resource officer. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I've stood here before you. I think myself and the Chief have both stood here before you talking about the SRO program. So uh, Superintendent Harvey asked me to, or asked us to put together something to discuss the SRO program. Um, I'm gonna try to keep it as brief as possible, that way if there's any questions, and then we're going to turn it over to uh, Selectman Madden and Selectman Farrell to talk about some other funding that we may have for this program. So first and foremost, you can hit that. First and foremost, uh, protect and serve. So when we talk about protecting, we also worry about in our profession is protecting youth. And protecting the youth and children from victimization in the homes, in schools, on the internet, and on the street is a fundam fundamental obligation of police. How does the SRO help us with this mission? The SRO in the schools works together with teachers, with your faculty, with your gym teachers, with your administration to meet this goal. We work hand in hand with the schools to do this, and that helps us to further protecting our youth and children. Go ahead. Um, what is an SRO? I'm going to give you the cookie cutter version of what an SRO is and then we can kind of dissect it from there. The definition by the uh, National Association of School Resource Officers, NASRA, is a school resource officer is a career law, enfor law enforcement officer with sworn authority deployed in community oriented policing assigned by the employee's police department or agency to work in collaboration with schools and community based organizations. That's a cookie cutter version. Um, I like to think that our towns are a little unique, but a lot of different ways. We have a unique relationship with Hamilton and Wenham. It's a unique marriage between the two, regional school districts, regional libraries. So we do have a unique relationship. Um, we have four of the five schools in Hamilton, one here. Um, we train together. Actually, we just, and I, I've got to, let me back up just a second. Um, I would like to thank all of you. We have Alice now. We were lacking for a long time. We train with the fire departments. Uh, we did it this past weekend. We train with uh, Wenham PD. We've been training together. We are much more advanced now in the security and safety of our schools than we were prior to Alice. So I thank all of you for that. Some of you were on the board when we pushed this through. It makes a huge difference um, for us as police officers, for the fire department, how to respond, how to, God forbid, we ever come, this ever happens to us, how to how to take people out of the schools, how to take the injured out of the schools. So we just had, uh, I'm remembering that because we just trained this weekend with the fire department, so thank you for that. So this is a cookie cutter version of what a SRO is. You can hit that one, Mike. Mm -hmm. Goals of the SRO program is to work in partnership with students, school administrators, teachers, and parents. Uh, we try to bridge the gap between officers and young people. And that's really a lot of what it is, is bridging the gap. It, it, you're going to hear me talk about relationships, because it's really about relationships. It's about relationships with the community, it's about relationships with the teachers, about relationships with the parents, relationship with the students, and relationships with the parents. Develop an understanding of a police officer's role in today's society, teach the value of our legal system, and promote respect for people and property everywhere. You know, and at the very end, we'll talk about citizenship, too. Please. The SRO's roles on campus, they're a community resource. They're there as a resource for the teachers, they're there as a resource for the administrators, they're there as a resource. Work with school administration to help develop uh, school safe strategies along with policies and procedures to keep schools safe. Work with guidance counselors and other student support staff. Assist students and to provide services to students where referrals to appropriate agencies are necessary, i.e. social services. Serve as a positive role model to students, provide law enforcement and police services to the school community. Work to prevent juvenile delinquency through close contact and positive relationship with students and establish crime prevention programs for students and there for conflict resolution. Go ahead, Mike. Some of the common um, misperceptions of SROs. 
Officers aren't there to make arrests. Actually, if you look, I think if you looked at combined stats, we do not make a lot of juvenile arrests. And I was with the district attorney today, and actually I brought up the SRO program, and the district attorney's office in Essex County, John Blodge, is big on um, referrals, big on, if we make juvenile arrests, and the way juvenile laws are right now, it's a little difficult anyway, but when we work with juveniles, it's not about arresting, it's about, a lot of the stuff we do is about parents, referrals to parents, and how can we prevent this from happening again? So part of the misconception is uh, that the cops want to put people behind bars. That's not, not in our community. And I've been a cop for 35 years and worked in different states and different communities. It's definitely not in this community. When law enforcement agencies and other juvenile system entities work together, it is clear that they share a common mission. And that's what we're looking to do. And that's why I also had the conversation with district attorney today. Why do SR programs work? SROs have a genuine interest in working with our youth. Youth, age-appropriate responses, uh, understanding of adolescent development, de-escalation techniques. SROs have an understanding of the school community. SROs have daily contact and involvement with the staff and students. Relationships mean everything. Everything is relationships. SROs and principals have a shared interest in maintaining a safe school environment. And that comes through training. It's training with the teachers. It's SRO training. There's several schools that you have to go to to go <coughs> through SRO. Go ahead, Mike. An interagency agreement is essential, specifying the role of the SRO, enforcing the law, making referrals to administrators for school discipline, teaching, counseling, and mentorship responsibilities. There's an interagency agreement that has to be hammered out between the town as well as the superintendent. Basically, it lies out in writing. This is what the SRO is going to do. It's not, SROs don't do discipline. That's not their role. School administration does discipline, not SROs. That's not their role. And a lot of times people think, well, they're in the discipline. No, that, that's not what they're there for. Go ahead, Mike. Um, in the end, it's really building relationships. Law enforcement students in the school community can work together to help schools provide safe and nurturing environments that promote students' academic success and reduce behaviors that put them at risk for juvenile justice involvement. The main goal of the SRO is to help develop, keep them away from juvenile justice, um, help work with them, the parents, the teachers, and, and end up having a better product at the end of the day. One more. I told you I'd keep it, keep it down. This is what it's really about at the end of the day, is citizenship. Help make things better, respect authority and obey laws, protect the environment, and be active in the community. At the end of the day, it's about citizenship. It's about young citizens going out in society. Now, this particular slide um, wasn't a slide. It was a picture that I took from a poster that's hanging in your middle school right now uh, when I was there this weekend <coughs> in training. And uh, that's really sums it up. That's what the SRO is supposed to do. It's just supposed to work on citizenship. That's from your school. And, and that really, in a nutshell, those four areas with the citizenship in the middle, that, that's what the SRO is, the goal of the SRO is at the end of the day. That's it. How was that, Mike? It was good. I know, I just went a minute over. <laughs> Seven Question. minutes, 30 seconds. Can you um, <laughs> just explain to us what a typical day would be like for an SRO? So we have middle schools as well as we have elementary schools as well as we have the high schools. Depending on where they are, an SRO could be sitting down, um, legs crossed on the floor, reading to a middle school, excuse me, an elementary school, and then leave there, go to the middle school, um, teaching a class that a teacher may ask for in the middle school. It really depends on which school they're at. It's really, it's what the school administrators and the teachers and the principals want. Now, I've spoken to some of the principals. Um, I've spoken to the superintendent, I've spoken to the assistant superintendent, and went to you, the uh, superintendent, assistant superintendent, and, they're a trace from high school, they've all had school resource offices. So we'd be sitting down with them and saying, okay, what are you looking for from your particular SRO? When your SRO comes into your building, what do you want from them? What are you looking for? Let's design the program specifically for your school and your application, because it's not a cookie cutter SRO program. It's actually designed for each school, because what Jennifer Cutler wants at her school might be different than Principal Heath wants at his school. So it's really what fits and what you're looking for. So do we? Have we had those discussions? Do we know what we would be using the SRO to do? Uh, it would it would depend on, and I think what the chief's saying is it would depend on the day. So, um, you know, I, 
I could see uh, you know an SRO actually going to the some of the wellness classes, for example, at the high school and talking about um, you know some of those citizenship pieces that we're looking at. Um, there's a whole new law coming on the books about about civics, and so there's a whole other piece that that the SRO might have a have a role in. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's you know I always described it in in the school I was the principal of as I wanted the SRO to be be in, like part of the furniture. That this person was there. It's a resource that we that we used. Kids expected to see every day, um, and was you know as I said visible and and you know building those relationships with students all the time. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, we had some of those times where we had to call on the SRO and, you know, we went by our, our um, local agreement to, to kind of talk things through about how, you know, if we needed the SRO to get involved, we would. Um, but there's a lot more than just, as you said, it's not there for discipline. And there's a lot more to do, um, you know, in the community policing end of things. And what's the difference between SRO and community policing? Community policing is, a, is, a, is an overall umbrella. That's a process. We're a community policing agency. Community policing, back in the 1950s, um, when they came up with mock patrol cars, and from there until about the 80s, 90s, all you saw was patrol cars go up and down. Community policing is getting the police officers out of the vehicles, walking downtown, going into the st stores, stores, shaking hands, talking to people, um, getting out of the cars. That was the community policing model. The SRO program is part of community policing. It's just a subsection of community policing. How do we measure success of the program? Actually, success is measured by students, parents, and school administrators, and teachers. Are they doing what we expect them to do? It, it takes a special person to be an SRO. It's not like, okay, you're the SRO. It doesn't work like that. You've got, it's the police chief sit down with the school administrators and the principal, you do interviews. You have to find the right person to be an SRO. Not everyone can be an SRO. It's gotta be unique, the right person. It's gotta be that officer who's willing to sit down on the floor um, and read a book to the first grade, color with the kindergartners, um, talk, play basketball, shoot hoops after school with the, with the seniors. It's got to be that right person. So this would be an entire, you know, creating a, you know, job search. And right. Oh yeah. I mean, that's. Uh, I believe the the statute requires that the police yeah. chiefs and I would be, you know, the, yeah. be involved in the hiring of this person. And so it's, it's a, uh, yeah. It, and I I agree with the chief. It's not everybody can do this, and you have to find the right person who can. Mm -hmm. Um, I've happened to work with some really good ones over the last couple of years, but, the but again, statute. those were through a hard, those were through a pretty entailed search. Right. Chapter 7137P specifically states it's the chief along with the school superintendent. So it's an interview process. Right. And so is this a 180, well, 184 day position or is it a it's 12 month year round position? Is it full time? Is it part time? This is a year-round position. They're in the schools 180 days, unless there's school summer programs, um, then they get involved in the school summer programs. So they would be around when there is, you know, if we have summer school programs mm -hmm. or whatnot. So uh, what would they do in the summer? If they have summer school programs? No, just summer school is maybe 30, 40 kids, and yeah. it's maybe three hours a day. What would this person do in the summertime? They'd rotate back to the field. So it's not full-time employed by the school? Well, that's when we talk about, when we get into the financial end, we can actually talk about that. I, I see where you're going. Yeah, no, they'll, they'll be in the schools for 180 days. Yeah. Um, they'll be there probably, it kind of follows your teacher's contracts. When the teachers go back to school, that's about the time they go back to school at the same time. Um, they still have vacations because it's a full-time job, but they still have vacations they have to take. Right. So. I mean, just talking off the top of my head, if it's your school vacation would line up with their school vacation, they still have school vacations in the summer. So these, it's 180 days, but they still contractually, they have to be off, they have vacation days they have to use as well. Right. That's it. I'm sorry, Chief, do you have anything? I'm sorry, I apologize. No, 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 I just echo Chief Stevens' uh, you know, need for the program. And like I said earlier, I mean, there's some programs already in place through the district attorney's office, community collaborative initiative, diversion, and this is just one more important piece of that puzzle. Right. Can I just ask, is there anything in, speci 
anything specific that you think we as a school district are lacking because we don't have an SRO currently? Or is it more of like you have been promoting the citizenship piece, which I completely agree with. Um, is it just an added benefit to the district or is there something that you feel like we're, we don't have right now because we don't have a school resource officer? So I, every couple of months I go in front of the selectmen to give a report. The one area that I feel that we're lacking in the town, uh, and I'll just speak for the town of Hamilton, four of the five schools, is an SRO. That's the one area that I think we are not, we are not suited or best suited for that. You live in Hamilton and Wenham, you've got great police protection, you've got good fire protection. We don't have an SRO, and, and I come from areas that have SROs, the captain comes from another PD, they have three full-time SROs. If you look around today, I was talking to some of the chiefs about their SROs, saying I was coming here, and their SRO programs, and they're telling me about the advantage of their having SROs. Um, we're one of the few schools up on the North Shore that do not have an SRO. Now that doesn't mean we have to have one just because everyone else has one. That's like saying my neighbor has a vet, Corvette, I want a Corvette. That's not what I'm looking for. But I really think that the one area that when I look at from a, a protective uh, coding or, or public safety standpoint is we don't have the SRO. And would you envision some of the programming that schools might want the SROs to engage in with the c children or students being safety in the community, safety at home, having people that you can rely on if something happens and think, because I know you were saying the juvenile justice piece, we're not looking to arrest children and that, you know, that isn't good for the district. Um, but I'm just wondering as far as like specific school safety measures, would they, is there any specific programming that you think they could put on or that you're aware other districts have done? Well, the, um, like I said, I'm really, I applaud all of us, the whole, both towns are doing the Alice program. That was a huge step in the right direction. But part of the SRO's job, when he or she is walking around those schools, is school safety, building safety, and, and, and coming up, telling the principal, hey, listen, you're leaving this back door unlocked. We probably need to lock that. So there's always a safety aspect. That's front and foremost to that, of the SRO, is to make sure building safety is there. But it's also student safety, too. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all can agree that it's probably tougher for the youth today to grow up in today's society than it was when we were younger. And there are certain, there are certain things that we should be doing, giving tools that we should be giving them to help them in today's society. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a parent, um, I'm a police officer, um, I, also, I also teach college at Merrimack, my wife's a school teacher. I've been doing public safety and public service my whole life, same thing with my wife. And these are areas that I think we, when, as it pertains to the youth, we need to do a better job than what we're doing. So I always stand in front of the selectmen and, and these two gentlemen can tell you, that's where I think we're lacking the most in our town. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a quick question, sorry. Um, so when they're not in school, so we've got 180, maybe 190 days, will they be working then as a police officer for the towns, Hamilton, Wenham, and then does that defray the cost? Then. Yep. Yep. So before we get into the, the cost things, and I, I was asked to help you all understand how uh, this is funded, uh, I want to do a little public shout out. Um, the previous slide talked about respect and how important that is in our, in our communities and uh, the role our police do. Uh, the departments in both towns are incredibly good. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, a few of us had the uh, pleasure of attending the induction of Chief Police Russ Stevens as the president of the Massachusetts uh, Association of Police Chiefs. So it's rare that <coughs> something like this happens in a small town, somebody with, uh, with Russ's skills that has not only impact here, but also in the state. So, and if you were there to hear, Mike was there, uh, if you were there to hear the testimonials that people talked about who knew him, it was the definition of respect. So uh, we couldn't do better than, than having the chief here. Uh, now, on uh, funding for the school resource officer. So uh, this, the funding for this is provided uh, not through taxes of our townspeople in Hamilton, but through what's called an impact fee. So this is an impact fee on a local business. Uh, the local business is Green Meadows Farm. Green Meadows Farm is going to begin the cultivation of uh, of organic medical marijuana. So as part of that, the town has to work out an agreement with them, which we've done, that's in place, 
and they are now going through their final permitting process with our uh, with our planning board and expect to be in operation sometime next year. This provides funds to us. The state takes a huge chunk of gross revenue that goes uh, to the state coffers. Uh, the towns have the ability to negotiate between one and three percent, depending on what's called the impact. The impact tends to be higher if there's uh, distribution in your town, some type of retail distribution, which is not allowed in Hamilton. Uh, we stopped, uh, we didn't allow that. And so this is a, a commercial operation only, uh, highly secure. We don't even know when the stuff's coming and going. It's tracked, There's, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages of regulation around this. But we gave us the opportunity to have a negotiation. And if you know the Patton family, uh, there's not a better family around. Uh, they are, when Major General George Patton bought the farm, uh, he always expressed the need that it had uh, a sustainability feature uh, from a business standpoint. He's a very practical kind of person. Well, if you know how farming has gone lately, especially small rural uh, areas like ourselves, uh, it's hard. So there was an organic uh, farm that was there before, couldn't, it didn't last. Uh, the manager decided to move on, it was hard to keep going. They need to do something else there, and this is something that they have a right to do. So they're proceeding ahead with this. We were fortunate enough to negotiate uh, 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 what's called a host community agreement between the town of Hamilton and Green Meadows Farm, where we get uh, one and a half percent of all the revenues up to, to six million dollars, and then 1.75 percent above that. And we have to justify that. It's not just a you know send Guido to go collect some some money. You gotta you gotta justify it. And one of the things is known in the state is it's good to have a school resource officer specifically in, imputed into a lot of these regulations. So that's where the money's coming from. The town of Hamilton will have this money and that's how we're gonna pay for it. And I can tell by both the budget presentation and some of your questions that that's caused some confusion because it's not a, a district employee. It's an employee of the town of Hamilton of the police department. So it won't so it, go on our budget then? No, it mm -hmm. wouldn't even. Well, no, so for year one, our assumption, given the lack of clarity around mm -hmm. revenue generation associated with Green Meadows, was that, and our desire to have the SRO in place on July, July 1st, 1st, effective in the new fiscal year, was to incorporate the full cost right. in the school district's budget, which is where it would normally go, in the absence of a host agreement. Right. So and that since we this have is a regional school too, so thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate yeah. it. But the idea is that this would be a Hamilton Town employee funded directly by the town of Hamilton as a flow down from this agreement with Green Meadows Farm. And the willingness to enter this right effective with July one is just fantastic because as as Chief Stevens said, uh, we do meet with him regularly and get updates about the town and our safety issues and the concerns that are there and the relationship with all of our with all of our community and he has continually reiterated the need for a, a school resource officer so now even if it, the beginning part is funded through your budget that's would be great and then it transitions to the town of Hamilton because you know that's where the, the money is really coming from Green Meadow Farm to pay for this it would be would be wonderful but that's that's a question right now as to when Green Meadows becomes profitable and actually starts making those payments right. to the town, right? Right. So, so this was all have about an from a budget perspective for us, because gotcha. we wanted it to be effective, for next having year. had discussions with the chiefs Perfect. on July 1st. So incorporate it in our budget recommendation. So it's there, and then once the funding kicks in through the town, then we don't then, spend it. Then we don't need to pay <laughs> right. through, for it through the district. That's really useful, because we saw um, the, until tonight, uh, I know you're gonna go into this more, but we got the release your materials last, last uh, year right. end, of, end of December with what the budget was and we saw the the dollar amount in there and wasn't sure why that would right. why it would be mm -hmm. there because we know this is gonna be funded directly for the town but that answers a lot of That's questions because uh, yeah. Chairman Farrell and myself also met with the chairman of the FinCom right. and the, their vice chair too so we're starting to get into our budget cycles and discussions with Mike who's mm -hmm. nice to come next next Monday to talk about it and that was gonna be one of our questions so do we know when any idea on timing on when Green Meadows is going to start up, or is that still all up in the air? Uh, no, I don't have a specific uh, knowledge of that. They're going through their uh, permitting process with the planning board. 
the, I think the total, they've already done site work out there. If you drive out the Asbury Street, you see construction fencing up. They can't presume things, but a lot of this is prefab units that all come together too because there's been a lot of work with the neighbors who had concerns about what was going on. Uh, so their last I heard from Bob Patton, who, was this, who is the, the CEO of Green Meadows Farm and, and running this, is that they were hoping to be operational by <coughs> mid to mid year or three quarters of the way into the year. But exactly when, I'm not sure. They're going to keep us up to, up to date with it, so and then we'll pass that along directly to you. Their goal is to be open for July 1st. No, it's not. No, no. mid to three quarters of the way. Their goal is to be operational as quickly as they can. There are a lot of state regs <laughs> regarding this stuff that's incredible. Uh, they're also um, working with our planning board, which sometimes can take time. And that's it's, what we had heard in terms of timeline, and therefore right. our recommendation. Right. Good idea. Yeah. And what if you know the organic farm didn't work? What if this business model goes up in smoke? Pendant pun intended and you get no money uh, do we continue where does the budget come yeah, to pay I, for that's it? a great question because that actually had a question that's pretty similar about you know, I had heard that some of the HDAs are coming under fire about whether or not um, you know they're actually legal in, in you know that some of the grow you know growers in the mass can or whatever they're called was actually wondering um, about whether or not these community agreements so I was wondering you know should something happen with um, the funding, you know, what, what would end up happening? Or much, like Peter said, it, it, you know, should the, something happen in, in the farm not be profitable and go under, you know? Uh, I presume if they're not making revenue, we're not getting revenue out of this. Uh, and, and therefore the, the expense and therefore would sit with us. we would still right, have the expense. So I think right. we're looking at a conservative approach of doing it. Uh, the market, as I understand it, is, uh, enormous and growing uh, oh, just in the retail the retail stores that opened that first weekend I think they did five million five million dollars uh, Green Meadows Farm already has uh, by regulation they also have distribute 45 percent of what they produce which is oils by the way what they do is they grow and then they manufacture they process all this product down to a bunch of oils uh, and the oils are then distributed through uh, a retail operation that they've got in the center of the state which is, or, which is permitted and they're just ready to go state. with that. They distribute nationwide or just in Massachusetts? No, just in Massachusetts. Oh, that's as far as their permit allows? Is that how it works? Yes, the, it's strictly a state of Massachusetts operation. The federal laws uh, prohibit interstate transportation and banking and a few other things that right. limit that. Okay. So we're thankful to have the patents in town and we're thankful to have the police department in town who's willing to help do this and thank you very much for including this in Thank the you. budget. So have you um, seen the suggested intermunicipal agreement from the Massachusetts School Committee's Association? I'm sorry, what agreement? So the Massachusetts School Committee's Association has proposed a template for um, intermunicipal agreements regarding SROs. Has that been provided to you guys to look at or? Nope. Okay. So we're looking forward to, I know that it's getting please try to be in there as often as I can, but now becoming a full-time thing integrated. I, when my kids were going through school, all four of my kids went through the district and it was pre this chief, uh, it would have been great if we had a police presence there that was part of the furniture that also commanded the kind of respect that, that our police do and was part of that community. I, I would have loved to have seen that. So thank you. Actually, Scott, uh, I'm curious, is the rest of the board and the FinCom of Hamilton okay with the town bearing the full cost of an SRO? <laughs> because it's a regional district. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of the students come from Hamilton, one third from Wenham. Right, so uh, we've had one question about what's Wenham doing or yep. people get all crazy about you know, it's one community. <laughs> this is one community. Uh, if you ask most people, they don't even know where the border is, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I also understand that uh, that uh, Wenham provides SRO services in this school, so that's already funded. 
of we, the day. Right? Hamilton hasn't had the funding source no, before. Really. Uh, so it's no, nice to no. finally be able to meet all the conditions <laughs> so of the statute don't. that says if you got the money, right. you do the, do the work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chief. All right. <clears throat> So next up, we, ne next yep. up, we have Stacy Busick, our Director of Student Services, to give a presentation on uh, out-of-district placements, tuitions, and related topics. <laughs> yeah, 89, but it's really hard to read. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me this evening. Um, again, I was asked to come and talk about our out of district um, tuition costs and the increases over the past several years. Um, I wanted to start with our mission in regards to the um, student services department in the district and our focus on individualized education programming and making it meaningful um, while also looking at providing the services in the least restrictive environment. That's part of our charge and a mandate um, through state and federal regulations. Also, we want to ensure that we are um, implementing consistently and equitably our, the regulations from the state and also through um, the federal special education components. And then being mindful of programmatic and fiscal responsibility when we're making determinations around um, services. So I was gonna start with just the IEP process. We have an idea <coughs> of what we go through in coming to determinations around student services, um, whether it's in district or it becomes an out of district placement. So we start with an initial evaluation request and that can happen through um, a parent request, school, through their um, IST process or a service provider. That can include um, early intervention or any person that is providing a service to a student, they can make the request. The requests come in and um, our coordinators process those requests. We are required to evaluate in the areas of suspected disability. When we receive a consent form to evaluate, there's a timeline and a process that kind of initiates. And so we're supposed to evaluate and complete our evaluations within 30 school days from the time of receiving the evaluation consent form and then we need to meet within 45 days and through the team meeting process is where the team of evaluators and parents and any other persons who um, have um, information regarding the student um, including the general education teacher review the evaluation reports talk about the student whether they're making pro progress within the general ed setting or not and make a determination around eligibility um, once a student has been determined to have an area of disability, then one of the things we need to look at is does the student require specially designed instruction or related services? And if so, an IEP is developed. And then based on the IEP that's developed, the proposed services, placement is determined. So placement, there's, there's different levels of placement. Most of our students fall within a full inclusion placement, and that means that less than 21% of the time, they're out of the general education classroom or general education setting receiving their services. Um, we also have partial inclusion, and that's where 21 to 60% of the student's time is receiving services outside of the general education setting. Um, Substantially separate classrooms, it's more than 60% of the time. They are not um, participating in general education activities, whether it's the classroom or other parts of the school day. We then go into the out of district placements, which fall into different categories, those being public separate day school, private separate day school, and residential placements. The public separate day school includes placements in other public school settings, um, public school districts that may have programs that we don't have. 
and also the consortiums fall under public separate day school programming. Um, about 66% of our students fall in the full inclusion right now, about 22% in the partial inclusion, and then about 3% in the substantially separate. And right now we're running about 12% of our students who are in out of district placements at this time. If there's a disagreement around the proposed IEP and placement, there are different options that can take place. Um, any rejected IEP or placement, we are required to send to um, the Bureau of Special Education Appeals or the BSEA, and they will then send information out to the parents about next steps in the process if they seek to pursue it. Um, sometimes with our disagreements or rejections of a proposed IEP and placement, sometimes it's just a discussion with the parent regarding um, their concerns. There may have been some miscommunications, some things missed in the paperwork. So sometimes we can kind of alleviate um, disagreements at that point. Other times it's scheduling a team meeting to review the recommendations and proposals that had been made. Um, sometimes it may be a facilitated team meeting. So a facilitator from the BSEA will come in and help support problem solving through the IEP process. Um, <coughs> other options are mediation. Both, both parties, parents and school, need to agree to mediation. And that is where, if there's still a disagreement, um, the BSEA, BSEA will provide a mediator who comes in and we have an assigned mediator for our district, the BSEA, and we try to come to a general consensus, consensus through mediation and then sometimes an agreement will be written up at that point. Who Question. decides for it to go, if it's to go to the state level? Who makes that decision? Once, actually, typically it's the parent. Um, the dis districts don't typically request hearings unless there's a concern for student safety. Um, districts can request mediation. Sometimes we're, if we're kind of stuck and don't feel like we're moving forward, we can <coughs> request mediation. Um, most of the mediation requests or hearings are typically on the parent end. Um, and then again, finally, that hearing piece. What's the percentage of that goes to litigation? There's a very small percentage. Um, there were over 400 hearing requests in the state for FY17, and F FY17 is the most recent data that the Bureau has up on their website, because they get a run through a cycle. Um, of that, there were 20 to 23 hearings. Um, so that, that also came to decision. So there's a very small percentage of the initial hearing requests that actually go to a physical hearing. Um, with the BSEA hearing process, um, or you know, there's another piece to it, settlement agreement. So once there's a hearing request, and it can be made either by the district or the parent, again, most hearing requests are happening through parent requests for hearing. Um, there's other steps that you take before you actually get to a hearing, um, and sometimes things can be resolved before you get to the hearing process. So there's a resolution meeting, which you're required to do within 15 days of being notified of the hearing. So it's really a, a meeting with the parent um, to have a discussion and see if we can come to consensus or agreement. Um, there's also, in, in lieu of or before getting to hearing, you can request a settlement conference and see if um, both parties can come together. It's mediated at the Bureau, um, typically by a hearing officer, and you try to come to resolution there, a settlement there. Um, there's also a component of pre-hearing <coughs> conference that doesn't always happen, but sometimes you have pre-hearing conference to discuss and um, kind of narrow down what the issues are before you're heading into hearing. Um, hearings typically are multi-day. Um, it's not a, a one and you're done. You, there's usually um, a couple days to several days in length, depending on the number of um, witnesses that are called on both sides. Um, and then about 25 days, calendar days, after the hearing, a decision's rendered by the hearing officer. Um, sometimes you get to a point where legal counsels on both sides have discussions and you don't even go through all of this process. You, you have settlement agreements that are negotiated 
in lieu of going through all of this. So there's different things that can happen when you get to the point of there's disagreement on programming and you just, you're getting, you, you can't kind of come to agreement and move forward, so. What's the percentage of win, like win, lose, and settle? Do you have those percentages? And then what the legal costs associated with that? Well, a whole bunch must settle. No. Only yes. 20 yeah. something yeah. out of 400 actually yeah. go to hearing. That's a huge number that must that settle. 22-23 for 2017, there were um, 10 that the decision was in favor of the district. However, that's not a clear cut number because you have to tease apart, like of those 10, Six of them, the parents were pro se and didn't have representation. Okay. Two of them, the parents had legal counsel. Two okay. of them, it was an advocate. So it's not like a clear it's cut. It's not clear cut. Yeah. Okay. What kind of accommodation and, and modifications do students receive while this process is going on? If it, it depends on what has been agreed to or not agreed to. Sometimes there will be an agreement to services. Sometimes it's. Um, they're not agreeing to placement, some, if, so it's very dependent. If it's an initial evaluation and nothing's been signed, there's no services happening. If the student already had an IEP, then that previous IEP is stay put while the, the next IEP is getting um, kind of worked through. So it really depends on the situation. So that's just a little background on kind of the process with the IEP and um, settlement agreements and um, hearing. Um, tuition, so I'm sorry if this is really hard <laughs> to see. Um, did a range analysis for the current tuition that we're paid. So this is based on our FY19 numbers that we're currently paying. So there's different things that can happen before an actual placement. Sometimes a team may request an extended evaluation and what that is, it's a short period of time, no more than eight weeks, where a student is placed in another setting <coughs> and we're doing an evaluation to, ter to determine what appropriate programming or services are needed for a student. Um, we typically do this when a student's not doing well in our district and we've tried a variety of different um, service options and accommodations and modifications and we're kind of still stuck on where do we need to go in helping the student. So the extended evaluations can range um, anywhere from around $10,700 to $18,000 depending on the placement of the extended evaluation. So we're talking consortium up to private day school placements. Um, public separate day, there's a wide range in public separate day just because you have your public schools and you also have your consortiums and then you have recovery that's a, a shorter kind of lower tuition and their range is different. So they have a non-special ed and special ed range in tuitions. Um, consortiums also have a range depending on if you <coughs> are a member or not. So for the North um, Shore Ed Consortium, we have a lower tuition cost than someone who's not a member. Um, same as we have students at SEAM, we're not a member district to SEAM, so we're paying a higher tuition there than member districts. But that range is between 32,760 to 72,000, also depending on the level of programming that the student requires. Um, so the average tuition that we're paying is about 42,611 um, for the public separate day. Um, private separate day schools has an even larger range because those are our private schools. Those are schools like Landmark, Hotting, Melmark. Um, their range can go anywhere from 38,000 up to 143,000 right now. So our average that we're paying is about 74,520 this year in um, private separate day schools. Residentials, the next step, um, they have a much higher range and can go anywhere from 82,000 up to three and 400 plus thousand dollars a year for that. Um, we're averaging right now for our residentials 106,195 in tuition. Um, with that, there are also additional expenses that need to be considered. Some of the programs we replace um, don't have services included in their tuition, um, such as speech and language or OT. Um, so for some schools, that's an additional cost. And there's a wide range. <laughs> yeah. There's a 
wide range in costs for the additionals. Um, yeah, if there's BCBA support, that's even higher. <laughs> um, paraprofessional or TA support, that's an additional cost as well if the student requires that, and there's a wide range in that. So, so there, there's a lot to consider in terms of it's just that. not tuition, it's, it's a lot of other things. So, so these costs are actually are set by the state, correct? Like in those, including those a la carte costs? Um, yeah, you have, yes, everything's set by the state. So um, OSD, um, Operational Services Division, sets the rates for approved special education private schools. So it's approved schools. So, um, and they also set the percentage of increases in tuition for each year. Mm -hmm. um, so just an example, back in FY16, um, the increase in tuition was 1.43% from going 15 into 16. Um, they're estimating FY19 into 20 at 2.63% hmm. right now. So. And so you later on you tell us we have four residential placements. So we have somebody who's at each one of those ranges or those are just ranges of schools that we might go to? The ranges are the lowest to the highest that you will find in the private schools. Okay. The average, the average is the average is what we're actually paying, taking those four residentials mm -hmm. and kind of averaging them out. Okay. There, there's other things too, and I just need to throw this out there because although OSD sets a, a rate of increase at a percentage, schools can also request um, reconstruction. And so with program reconstruction, they can request that they increase their tuition higher than the set percentage by OSD. Um, and that has happened in the past. Isn't that nice? Consortiums set their own rates. They're not OSD. Um, so there, there's boards that um, will approve the, the rates. And for the consortium, they've had, um, in one year, they had about 9% increase in tuition, and that was back in FY 15, 16, 16. And since then, it's been around the 3% increase range. So, so our audit district costs. Um, they have increased significantly since FY15, and I know um, in last year when we looked at, at the, my annual report, FY14 to FY18, there was pretty much a double in the amount of out-of-district students that we had. Um, so this is what we've done in terms of how we've projected over the last few years and then what's been budgeted <coughs> in terms of the tuitions. And then we've had like what our actual ending up um, tuition costs were. Um, special ed is a moving target. It changes rapidly. Um, our projection right now for FY20 has already changed based on some, some placements. Um, when we did our initial projection, we estimated at a higher cost for a placement, which was now at a lower cost because it was a different placement than planned. So, so it fluctuates a lot. Um, and again, our numbers have been increasing pretty significantly since um, 14, 15, FY. And can you give us an idea of why that is? I think there, there's... <laughs> I mean, is it that we're not providing programming? Is it that we have students who are moving into the district that have higher needs? You know, the, Do the we question have came up, and it came up in the last school committee meeting. Um, there, I haven't seen a pattern in looking at all of this that it's move-ins to the district. We don't have parents moving in, and then we're sending kids out. Um, I think there was, for a number of years, um, programming deficiencies. And so we've been working on kind of getting programs up and running. Also looking at programs, um, you know, a program you've had for so many years, you have to look at your student populations and kind of project and maybe make shifts in the programming. Um, and I can talk about that when I get to some later slides about what we've done. Um, and could you possibly, do you know why it's been so hard to be a little bit more accurate with the out of these cot of the amount of students? I mean, should we, maybe you come visit us more often to kind of, because we've been thrown off guard with some of these costs just out of like, it seems left field, like all of a sudden, sorry, we're now 800,000 over mm -hmm. on out of district placement. It's, it's just crazy. Um, it's a moving target. We can predict as much as possible, but 
things do shift and change. So if you look at, um, like for FY19 this year, our original projection was, was 50. We budgeted at 42. We're at 48 placements to date. So we're less than what we projected. Um, we're more than what we budgeted. Um, it's just, you, you have to, we're looking at projections so far ahead of the following year and there's lots of factors and things happen with kids. We have kids that, um, for a lot of reasons, maybe social, emotional, and mental health reasons, are having a lot of challenges and need the separate setting to, um, to access and learn. Um, you know, we have students who we feel like we're making good progress with them, and then when you look at the trajectory for them, um, there's a point where progress is kind of stagnant and they need a different setting. We have some kids who, once they hit the, the upper grades, particularly with middle school and high school, for our more intensive kids, where their needs <coughs> become much more than what we can provide <coughs> in a public school setting. So there's so many different factors that fall into um, why our numbers are increasing. Um, <coughs> how many of those increases are, the team has decided that a placement outside the district is necessary versus the parents have decided and have pushed back? We, I can give you an example in FY18, um, we had six total extended evaluations that happened. Two were a carryover from the following school year and kind of mm -hmm. there wasn't an, there wasn't an eight weeks in the school year so yep. it rolled over and then through the course of FY18 we had four more extended evals because the students had significant needs and, and we weren't being effective with them. So. What happens typically with extended evals, more often than not, they're rolling into a permanent placement. So, so um, those were ones that were determined by the team that the it was team, best to go out. team determinations, yeah. Versus how many were parents placed them and now we're paying for them? We have, um, looking at backwards to FY15, okay. this is what, if you look at the <coughs> middle row, um, this is what our unilateral placements look like. So this is where parents were initially placed in another setting um, or informed us in the following year that their child would be going to a, another um, private special education setting. And how many of those are we paying for now? Um, we are <laughs> paying for... So <coughs> everything that we see in unilateral has moved into ones that we pay? Those are all minus the one in process that we are paying up to FY19. FY20 is just a, a projection based on what has been told to us. So those so have like, all ended up in um, so like eight an agreement. Teen agreement. parents decided outside of the team process that it, uh, we weren't meeting their needs. Yeah, that, I mean okay. parents do have concerns regarding their children and, and they may not agree with our programming mm -hmm. or or how much progress their child's making, so they make the decision to unilaterally place. So. We have a lot of settlement agreements in the district. You can see the numbers, there's quite a few. And those are um, in total, so you know, you've got an FY15, it may have initiated in FY14, but it's a continuous, so these are the numbers. Right now we have active 18 settlement agreements. Do you think you could give us more, instead of like it seems once a year, just so we don't have the heart attack, you know, just a little bit more updates on this throughout the I year? I would be happy because to I come know whenever you want for updates. Okay. Yeah. So in um, the past, we used to get a lot of updates when they were increasing, and now it just, I feel like we're bombarded, it seems at the end, just kind of yeah. the shock factor. When you well, see the budget, can I ask this question? Yet? So, so we yeah, have I, eight. I don't, I don't, I don't like that you actually just said that about years past getting more, because they actually the stats prove that the years past there was actually less. No, it, it was just less up, there were more updates. There were in so past. There were, there were like less placements. No, right, but we did get more information. Uh, we used to get more information. So, so beyond the annual report. Yes, coming yeah. for yes, budget. updates when. You know, there were more settlements, so we are a little bit more prepared and not just all of a sudden, you know. So we have roughly 50 out-of-district placements, and 18 of those are settlements. And so then the other... Well, you can't, you can't do a total here because, again, FY15, the student may no longer be what the student could have graduated, so it depends on where 
and when it happened at what grade level. Um, these, are, these are totals across. Um, so the 18 that's in, so I'm looking yeah. at FY 18, 19, where it says there's 18 So there's settlement 18 agreements. settlement so agreements. So that's okay, I thought you were looking at all the agreements. Units. Active agreements. It's not like we did 18 this year. There's no, 18 no, those that are, are the active. active. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, again, this year we, we've done one and there's one in process. So. Right. And it looks like so maybe somebody's going to age out. There's an age out yeah. there. This is a breakdown of, of where our students are getting placed. So the, again, the public day school is um, public school settings that we've placed students in and the consortiums. So the majority are North Shore Ed Consortium placements. Um, we do have a public school placement and that placement and two placements at another consortium, but they're primarily like local. Um, private day, I broke down the three top placements in this area where students are going, and so Landmark, um, we've significantly increased Landmark placements over the past several years. Um, New England Ca Academy has, has decreased, um, and then Hopeful Journeys is, has increased significantly. Is that a new place, or I'm just wondering why it's going up, yeah, up, it's up, new. if it's new? It's, you know, a lot of this is, it's, Students require intensive programming, so it's for our autism population, um, and we have had a higher level of, of autism, yeah, um, awesome. disability in our district, and students who just require that more, it's year-round, um, lots of individualized instruction, something that we can't necessarily provide in a public school setting. Um, and does Hopeful Journeys older kids too or just younger kids <coughs> they start young and go up to 22 so they are okay. um, pre-k to 22 so we may have had kids that maybe fit the New England Academy profile but maybe now fit the hopeful journeys profile too. They're two different profiles no. they're different okay. yeah hopeful journeys is much more um, intensive need um, okay. whereas New England Academy um, their their population at this point there it's they're average to superior cognitive range, and also their goal is post-secondary education, okay. so they're looking at college yep. and career, right. yeah. And when you have non-DESE approved, that doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the school, it just means that no, they're not they're on just, that list that's yeah, regulated. They're, just, they're, they're, don't, they're, they're not approved by DESE, and they don't fall under the OSD rate setting, so they're not listed on the in-state tuition. So those are, those are schools like your Clark schools, um, Eagle Hill. Um, okay. I can think of. Okay. Um, and then our, our res residentials have stayed fairly steady. We do have a significant number in residential. These are the grade levels or age levels where um, the out of districts are being placed from. So. Um, our elementary, we're not placing as many out at the elementary level. However, you also need to consider those that were elementary may now be hitting that middle school, those middle schools. So, you know, you have that effect as well as um, most of our placements last year were um, between middle school and high school with a significantly more, with a higher number at the high school level. And it also looks postgraduates really jumped up in the last couple of years. Those are postgraduates, so we don't have a program for students right. 18 to 22, yeah. so it does increase because we have students who may need a fifth year or we may keep them till 22 they because they need services. College, mm -hmm. So that's why you'll see that number increasing as the numbers are shifting. Yeah. What does the SP stand for after postgraduate? It's, it's the, the post-secondary. Oh, okay. So how did, so we implemented a program at the high school. Mm -hmm. Did it start this year or did it start last year? This year. Sure. So yeah. how did that affect those out of district placements that we just um, saw? We have two students in the program um, and one of which we kept out from having to do a placement and one of which we brought back. So <coughs> and we, ha we anticipate um, 
with our projections increasing the program numbers next year. So is that cost savings for this year or not going to happen for a couple of years? Um, we anticipate that they will stay with us through high school. But no, cost savings I think as far as the cost of going out of district as opposed to having the teacher cost and savings, yes. Yes, we have a cost savings with that them was not one of going the out of district. Things that the Hamilton FinCom was looking for is just an analysis of what that cost savings actually was this year, or loss if it was, and then what it might be, you know, maybe for the next couple <laughs> years through their, what do you call that, matriculation? Is that what you would call that for their number of years at school? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and we had done that last year with the mm -hmm. budget. Um, I didn't do that for this presentation solely. Yeah, that was we the basis of the critical the, priority yeah. presentation, and how right? We, right, right. Yeah. And how we get the program. Yeah. But I think they want to like well, we're only know six, that it came out yes. real. Well, we're only six months when, into yeah. it, so it's hard, yeah. it's hard to yeah. say. Yeah. Well, I mean, we brought a person back from out of district placement. I'm sure right. Stacy has the number of how much that student would have cost us out of district otherwise. And I can, I can do that for the, the annual reporting as well because they're new programs and, and do an analysis of that with that um, all the great. other information that's included. Thank you. Thanks. So Stacey, are you, are you anticipating any additional students coming into that program for next year in this particular budget? We do, we'll be projecting budget? middle school students moving up into so that program. So retaining them, okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. Retaining them, but do you expect any program. that are in middle school out of district coming back next year? Um, or have you even thought about that at this point? That's <laughs> haven't even thought about that yet. Okay. Um, we, do, we do have a student at middle school, but we're projecting to have them come back for ninth grade. Um, but that's, that's not next but year. But he's not, that's a, a, he yeah. or she is so not we, an eighth grader right now. Yeah. 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 But our assumptions for <clears throat> implementing the new programs only assumed students coming through the pipeline. Right. Not coming back. Yeah, yeah. we're here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Ideally, came back. Okay. Our goal is to get students back because, again, like least restrictive environment, and, and kids deserve to be in their home school um, with, you know, right. their neighbors and, and things like that. Um, is there any mm -hmm. thought of trying to be a tuition school? That program, or or we, do, is it not unique enough to be that? No, I've had I've had other districts contact me. I mean, what's what's unique about Hamilton Wenham is it's a smaller district. Um, so is your building programs. Other public schools are looking for programming without having to send them to a private day. So I've had other districts contacting me about tuitioning students in. Um, with the programs last year, because they were so new, <coughs> I did not do that because we had to get through a year. We yeah. also were hiring new staff and we wanted to make sure we had everything, um, you know, where we wanted it to be before we pulled others in. We want to make sure we're taking care of our students first um, before we start bringing in other students. Okay. But yes, that is um, something that we've been approached about and are looking at. Um, this was our out of district enrollment by disability. <coughs> um, so this is currently where we're standing in terms of the disability categories and, and who is out of district. I will tell you that um, health impairment is we have the highest percentage of students on IEPs in our district with a health impairment as their primary disability. Um, specific learning disability is next. Um, and within specific learning disability, there's different categories that um, fall into the areas of reading um, and written language and math and also um, oral expression. Um, so you can have an SLD in any of those areas or multiple areas. And then autism is our third category within the district that um, has a higher percentage of students with special education. And what needs. do the stars mean? I just asterisk. These are, these are in kind of order of placements, semi, but the asterisks are the ones that within our district are our top three for students within the district. And this is just out of district. So those health impairments aren't the ADD type of health impairment. These are other. ADHD could be other health impairments as well. Um, I will tell you that the majority have an ADHD or ADD diagnosis oh, okay. um, under the health impairment. Okay. Yeah. okay. So someone who has what we would typically call an illness of some sort 
that would fall under maybe that multiple fall disabilities under the health or something as else. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing with this, the emotional impairment, although the numbers are not as high as like autism or specific learning disability, these categories are all like primary disability. Yeah. Um, we can use multiple, multiple is in there. Um, when we, the team can't determine a primary disability and there's other you know, areas that are also of concern. Um, but the emotional impairment, we have students who may have been placed out who their primary diagnosis is ADHD, but they've had social emotional or other mental health -ish concerns that we could not support <laughs> in district and they needed you know, a more therapeutic setting. Um, Autism, when you start to get into like middle and high school, other um, areas of, of concern can crop up. Sometimes behavior gets more significant. Sometimes there's mental health issues that kind of come into play as well. Um, you know, students, even with specific learning disability, they may have anxiety because of their disability has impeded their ability to make progress. So there, there's other issues besides just those disability categories um, that come into play. Um, so. There are kids who, because of emotional um, challenges, may have been placed, but it's not their primary disability. Um, so looking at what we've done to date, um, starting with the high school level, we did add our intensive learning academic skills program um, this year. Um, we've also, <coughs> we transitioned in academic support to a therapeutic learning center. Um, last year, the, the four throughout the year that we sent out for extended evaluations, um, if we had had this last year, we may not have sent them out because we could have provided the support. So our therapeutic learning center has an, a special education teacher and also a school counselor attached to it and they do a lot of work during the academic support times, not only around academics, but also around emotional regulation and kind of supporting with crisis. Um, we've also added the language-based program at the high school level, and we have five students in that program now as a start, and we anticipate um, three moving up from the middle school next year. And then the RISE program, which started, which was initiated before I came in, but started last school year, has also helped in supporting students with um, mental health and social emotional needs, our school refusals. They help get them back into school and, and kind of try to get them up to speed in um, you know, a very therapeutic way so they can um, return to the classroom. At the middle school level, we're providing ongoing support and consultation to our language-based program there, as well as the general education staff. And I do need to say back up with the high school in the language-based <coughs> program, we also have ongoing support and consultation that's happening um, through Landmark um, as well for both of those levels to um, support not just our special education teachers, but the general education staff who have the language-based students in their classrooms as well. Um, we, at the middle school level, reformatted the intensive learning program, so it's more of an intensive learning academic skills program. So we kind of widened the student profile to support more students moving up um, from the elementary <coughs> school. And then for both the high school and middle school, in terms of what we've done for professional development, we've been focusing on inclusive practices. So along with um, Peggy, we've organized PD for all of the middle and high school staff to, to help the teachers better support all of our students in the classroom. Um, we had a training in October, and we have another one coming up um, March or April. So we'll continue that support for our, our general education and special education staff. We've been doing IEP writing professional development, really targeting um, data and making sure we have data in making determinations <coughs> at the IEP meeting and having data to write our IEPs. So goals need to be data-based, our progress reports need to be data-based so we can ensure that we are constantly looking at are we meeting the needs of the students and are they progressing at the rate we want them to. Um, we also have training for the high school and middle school staff in foundational reading and spelling. 
so that Orton Gillingham kind of approach. And then we've also provided specific and targeted training um, for staff in visualization and verbalization, LIPS and Orton Gillingham. So we're continuing to look at the professional development needs in the staff so we can better support our students. Have you, I know you implemented a lot of those programs. Have you done like, I wanna say, return on investment, like to see how you might have cost savings by implementing these programs to help students so you're not placing them out or extra services outside. I'm just curious if you've done some kind of cost analysis of the cost and the return on investment of who it's helping and what <coughs> it's helping. We had talked earlier about how before adding the programs, we did a, a kind of a cost benefit analysis and projected out our cost savings. Um, haven't circled back to that yet because we're we're not through the full year, but um, what again I will do for the annual report is I can embed that information into the annual report so we okay. can see like what type of savings we've we've had and, and the numbers of students we've been able to support. Yeah, I know we've been you talked about out of district placement, but I was yeah. thinking just those other programs that mm -hmm. we've also implemented, that would be great. Yeah. yeah, we can do that for the annual report. Um, at the elementary level, we've, we've moved some tier three and special <coughs> education instructional supports to tier two. Um, examples of that are the Lexia Core 5, which used to be just for special ed students, but it's a great program to, for skill-based support, um, and so now all of the students, whoever needs it, has access to it. Um, the same with our fluency programs, so, um, you know, students who are in tier two who need some fluency work have access to those. Um, we've provided Orton Gillingham professional development. We have a lot of teachers trained in Orton Gillingham, so this is really a stick, take a step back and look at how can you group students, how, what are some additional strategies you can be utilizing. Um, at all levels, we are meeting um, vertically as a department, so we have done that this year, and during those vertical meetings, which means all of the special education staff, elementary, pre-K, <laughs> pre-K, elementary, middle, and high school are meeting together, and we're talking, we've looked at data, student data at the beginning of the year. We'll continue to have data reviews. We're talking about the data they're using. Um, we're looking at our programs and, and looking at our program descriptions and talking about our students and making sure that our programs are meeting the profiles of the students and the needs of the students and we're reworking those as needed. Um, we're researching and, and trying and looking at adding instructional materials. Um, and curriculum programs to the academic support centers, things such as RAVO. Um, we're looking at um, math programs to better support instruction in our academic support centers. And then we've been doing um, this year teacher assistant trainings. So we have um, five, about five scheduled meetings, afternoons um, where they come back and we're providing training, very targeted training for them. So things, I think one of the questions was, what do we need to continue to do? I think we need to continue to do all of these things. I think we need to very, be very vigilant in looking at our data and looking at our students and making sure that we have the programs and the supports in place to meet their needs. I think the work that um, the curriculum coordinators are doing with tier one instruction in the classroom is also going to help, um, as well as the work they're gonna be doing with the tier two instruction. Um, those need to be strong and in place and those will help, particularly with our SLD. Um, disability categories um, and I think Stacy how's things going with the new position that we approved for this year the out-of-district coordinator we have, position um, good we have the, a new out-of-district coordinator which has been very helpful she is spending part of her time with the out-of-district and also part of her time she's picking up the um, meetings at the secondary level, particularly the middle school we've assigned her to. So that, what has, that has done has helped alleviate some of the responsibility that Lindsay has had to chairing team meetings. And she's now able to spend more time um, observing, facilitating, collaborating with staff and, and kind of overseeing our programs that we've added and also the programs that have been in place at the middle and high school level. So I think it's been very beneficial um, in how we've kind of moved to support our students this year. What are the total number of students we have on an IEP in the district? There, um, I had to ask me this. Um, there are about 342 around that area. And what percentage is that of our total school population? Um, we are around, 
I can't give that exact. Is that 18, 19 percent? It's not. I think um, honestly, we're around 16 percent or so. We have 1,800 kids. Um, so you're saying it's how much? So if she said 342, and we have yeah. so that'd be I don't know 18. 18 percent. The 18 percent. But that's total IEPs in the district, not it's out everybody. of not just out of district no, placements. That's not no, total. that's yeah. with oh. our out of district. Yeah. Is that on average for a district of our size, or is that? Nineteen. Nineteen. <laughs> Thank that's you. Close. I didn't have that number off the top of my head right I'm now. Like technical. And so the. <laughs> And this 340 includes the 50 whatever out of district. It includes the out of district in that number. It does. I think our numbers are high. Uh, I think our. Um, you think what are numbers are high? How what? are we with our cohorts for that? Like Manchester, Essex. Manchester, Essex. Oh I haven't looked at them because th or they're Ipswich they're not. Or believe it or not, they're they're not. Um, districts similar to us in terms that they are in size, but when you go on to like the radar, there are different districts that are um, similar to us that they rate us against. Um, Manchester Essex is not one of them. What's no. radar? Um, is it's that different state. than the DART? It's a state reporting mm -hmm. system. It's like the DART, but it's the radar is strictly special ed. So who would a okay. cohort on this be? Who are we comparable to then? Is um, it, are they regional school district or are they regular? It's all different. There was, um, I have to pull up the radar. Okay. Hold on a second. I can't answer that without looking at it. They're all it's different. Like way okay. Too many. I just, I'm surprised that we're not, that Manchester Essex is not a comp. No, there's lots of well, different factors they look at. Right. Um, Slow to. So our comparison district. They're not pulling up. So these are our comparison districts. Cohasset, Dover, Sherburn, Duxbury, Georgetown, Broughton, Dunstable, Pink mm -hmm. Phillip, Linfield, Maskinomet, Menden, Upton, and Norwell. And this is for special ed. Yep. And is that like pro that we're comparative to them because we have the same programming opportunities or we send similar students out of district to <coughs> what is the why how it it's generally it's enrollment it's uh percentages of subgroups uh economically disadvantaged per percentages of uh english language learners those are that's what they're looking so at. it really has no bearing on services we offer in district no it's it's, de it's a demographic so, okay, so it's so kind of why useless for Essex is the extended not here, though, looking at because they're looking at the disability category yes. types, yeah. and they're also looking at so. where students are falling and students with disabilities in terms of um, the MCAS component. Okay. okay. Yeah, that, those King Phillips people, I've met them; they're fun. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that? Right? It's kind of Western yeah. Mass. Yeah, Central. Is actually, um, yeah. Massasoit. That's his yeah. English name. Are there so any the other the questions that I have? Right. Sort of an open-ended question for you. Um, other than the things that we've done in the past year, other than the wonderful things you've already done for mm -hmm. the district, are there any long-ranging, open-ended, you know, programs that we could could be doing that would further benefit? The, any of our students or the ability for us to keep anybody else in district? I don't think at this point we need to create any more programming. I think we need to continue to work on enhancing our programming. And I think one of the things that we've really got to start focusing on, because um, it's significant across the district, um, is the social emotional um, status of our students and making sure we get enough supports 
in there for those students, <coughs> whether they have a diagnosis of ang anxiety or PTSD or um, they're just, their coping strategies are not strong enough to kind of support when they're challenged academically or challenged socially. So I think we need to continue to work on that. And I know Kristen Lazaro, in the, in, in, as the director for guidance um, in counseling, she's doing a great job. They're, they're doing a lot of work as a group in um, looking at how they can better support students at all levels. So, so we just, we need to continue that work. Because I don't think that's going to change. I think the emotional, social emotional supports of our students are going to continue to increase and create challenges for us. Um, my last question is data driven. Uh, how many cases are we currently in uh, settlement negotiations, or you know, how many how many cases are we? Do we have any active, open-ended, you know, they could become out of district, you know, before the end of the year? Right now, um, not before the end of the year, no. We have, um, again, on there, there was one settlement agreement that's been in process, but that's, that, that's somebody not sitting in our district at this point. No, I'm not. I'm not but asking you to have a crystal ball, but at the moment, you, uh, you're only you were you, in the midst of reviewing and mm -hmm. doing all of that work. Uh, but there aren't any additional new people, you know, that we could otherwise project for next year. Uh, in addition to that, we did our projections for next year. Um, it's it's hard to say. I I don't feel at this point that there's anybody that we have going out anytime soon. I think we've, we're really working to support students in, def, in district, but again, things can change. Um, you know, a move-in could come in, um, which would be an out-of-district, or something substantial could happen with a student that creates the need for an out-of-district. Um, right now, I, there's nothing emergent that's standing out. But, you know, Barring any crystal ball, somebody could, <laughs> something could happen tomorrow that would change that number. Yes, yeah. Again, special ed's a moving target. I mean, we um, saw that this year, right? We yeah. budgeted 42 and it's 48, 48 to 50 yeah. right yeah. now, so. Yeah. <coughs> hey, Stacy, I don't know. Is it possible to sort of look at the IEPs in at a macro level and see if there's patterns developing, you know, that, that we could help project, or I don't know if that's something that you already do, and you know, maybe also with our out of district placements in, in sort of coming up with some sort of data set on where, you know, um, you know, obviously there, there, there's a, you know, um, stark increase in, in, in out of district placements, right? And it's obviously a, a problem for all of us. Um, and while we understand the continued sort of growing need to really support these students. You know, sometimes I, I actually look at the lower numbers wondering if we were just weren't doing a good enough job at supporting all of our students then or if, you know how that's happening and seeing if you know if, if there's a trend or a pattern that could sort of be recognized you know in, in the developing needs mm -hmm. you know and, and as you said you know you, you see a, a, a need to sort of try and grow that social, uh, social emotional learning in house, but you know, if, if there's something else that could be more pinpointed by perhaps, but just by, you know, kind of looking where these IEPs are are stemming from, or if that's even legal, you know. I mean, we're we're constantly looking at our IEPs. Um, in fact, I mean, we've had some, we have somebody in who's doing specific IEP training with staff as well. Um, I, I think your question is in terms of what we have in IEPs and whether that's meeting the needs of our students. Um, so we are we have to meet on IEPs on a yearly basis. We have to look at how students are doing and we have to write new IEPs um, based on student need. Again, we're really looking at um, particularly at the secondary level, more data and being more data driven in our decisions. So I think that is going to help us um, improve on our goal writing 
and in making better decisions in terms of what modifications or what accommodations are needed for students, which will then kind of help support students in progressing better. So I, I, I'm thinking more sort of trying to figure out where, where if there's a, a pattern line, you know, that, that's happening, say, at the high school level that you see coming that can then maybe be traced back that, oh, this is something that maybe we can start implementing at the elementary level so that by the time they move up, um, you know, we're addressing that problem ahead of time. You know, if, if there's any, it, any, anything we can sort of get out of looking at like, okay, well, this, you know, what are these, these you know, students' needs mm -hmm. here? And just, you know, at, again, at a blind, you know, macro level, seeing if there's something, you know, because you, you're diving in trying to figure out what all these individual needs are. Mm -hmm. but, you know, maybe there's something that develops as you pull back a little. I think as we're meeting now in our vertical teams and the elementary and the middle and the high school staff are sitting down together and having discussions, I think we'll start to see kind of where maybe there are some gaps that we need to fill in or where the trends are. Um, they hadn't been meeting vertically, um, so now it's open discussions and really talking about students. So I think as we continue that work, we'll start to find maybe specific trends or specific areas yeah. we need to target better. Okay, that's but, great. You yeah. know, and like I said, sometimes I, I look at those numbers and, and I do wonder if now we're just doing a better job, you know, or you're doing a better job, you know, at your, at your job and sort of realizing that there are these students that are, that have these needs mm -hmm. and that we're making sure we're meeting these kids' needs that, you know, maybe, you know, I hate to say it, but might have actually been subject to the cracks a little in years past. So I, I don't know about mm -hmm. that. I think everybody's working really hard across the district. I think our gen ed staff, our counselors, our special education staff, everybody is working really hard to try and support the students um, and ensure that they're progressing. But um, yeah, the, I mean, the, there are kids with disabilities and it's more challenging for them. So are we making sure that we're meeting all of their needs and consistently? So in the things that we need, you talked about maybe just more social, emotional type stuff. Do, is there any looking for your department to sort of take that on, maybe training with principals, trainings with teachers, trainings with other people, or how, how could we do that? I think that the, the school counseling and guidance department is doing a lot of that work now. Um, they're sitting in and they're participating in trainings that are focusing on improving and supporting students with their, their social growth and emotional growth. Um, so we're doing the work um, and we'll continue to do the work. I think that um, you know, we always need to look at what are some great professional development opportunities, whether it's bringing people in, dis in district or um, sending staff out. Um, this year, we focused on <coughs> our need for improvement in our inclusive practices. So that has been our focus this year. Um, and along with the two days that the person's coming in, they're also providing consultation to the department. So um, it's continuous and ongoing support. And that, so. that was secondary level. You know, mm -hmm. uh, at the elementary level, we recommitted to responsive classroom training yep. and had them come in. I think that was a four-day training. I'm trying to remember. They did Peggy. a four or five-day tra yeah, four training. It was, it was four, four days, days of uh, almost every elementary classroom teacher went back through responsive classroom. And again, that's a social-emotional um, and program. we included special education staff in that training as yep. well, so it wasn't just classroom teachers. So everybody's using the same language and providing the same kind of strategies and supports to students. Well, and I can tell you, like, like out in the world out there with people who are dealing with kids, everybody knows the clap. Like how, that, because every kid in Hamilton Wenham knows when you hear that clap, the that it's uh, time to stop talking, yeah. it's time to start listening, and it's, and, and it's just, it's, just been ingrained in the kids in this district, so it's very that responsive classroom, and that's mm -hmm. like this minute so part, of it, part of it, but right. it's very effective. And also, you didn't even bring this up at the middle school level. We've got PBIS training, right? Um, so the what training? PBIS, positive, so positive behavior intervention, intervention system. So we have a team uh, that's going out a couple of days a month. Or it's I think it's six days or something like that to do yeah, uh, sure. training with. Training. Yeah. Uh, and it's through UConn, May. right? It's UConn, it's, it's um, supported yeah. through the Department of right. the Ed. Department of um, Education is doing it through the University of Connecticut. So we send 
So the middle school has a team that's going out and then is coming back and is going to be implementing that system in the middle school. So it'll be a train that a, a team that's training the right. rest of the staff. So so we're moving in positive directions in a lot of ways and in, in looking at and focusing on student supports, whether it's special ed or general ed. Stacy, I have a question, um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you have the answer to this or not, but um, I think you were here tonight during um, the chiefs talking about the need for their recommendation for a school resource officer, and I'm thinking, my question comes more thinking about those a population of students that we need to focus on the social and emotional mental health piece. Do you see or have you heard of other districts who have SROs where they are involved sort of in that? Um, that class of students and being able to be effective in any way and helping to keep them in in the general classroom or could you perceive that being an added benefit? I, I come from a district that had school resource officers. Tell us about it. We <coughs> added a second one. So um, there's always benefit to having a school resource officer in your district for, for multiple reasons. And even for, for some kids, just having a connection is, is believe it or not, like having a connection with an officer kind of helps them in maybe making some better decisions or if they're challenged with getting to school, um, helping them get in the building. And, and no. So, we can uh, so them. would you want to use yeah. the resource officer as, or would, could you see implementing the resource, resource officer in part of the special education curriculum if well, I think you were that able to? The use of the school resource officer is the, the responsibility of the buildings to determine how they are using their school resource officers. But at the same time, our special ed students are in those buildings. So my expectation is that, you know, whatever support is needed for any student, it's provided. So one of the trainings that all of our guidance uh, staff went through was mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. And that's so dealing with students in crisis. That would be something I would want to see a school resource officer take that training too. That's what I was thinking yeah. too, but I was I don't really have and any. And we actually trained Kristen Lazaro as a trainer for right. mental health. So she can train anybody coming into our district right. to work with students. And, I, and well. the chief mentioned crisis, crisis de-escalation. That's our, our CPI training that we do every year with our staff of it's crisis prevention. So it's how to how to work with students who are, you know, coming up and actually to de-escalate a situation before it actually becomes an issue. I mean, that's another training that we would have, I think the SRO would be right in the middle of. Right. We have a lot of um, teachers and, and TAs in the district trained in CPI, as well as administration. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I do want to recognize Maureen Smith, who is our elementary special education coordinator who joined us tonight as well. And, um, and I can personally say she's fabulous. She, she's, yeah. <laughs> she um, sees me more than she wants to, I'm sure. A great team <laughs> member. So, right, thank you, have a good night. Thanks, thank Stacy. Thanks, Let's get the number. As long as I could read it. So, at, so at this point, we'll I'm going to make the OPEP presentation from here. Uh, so, OPEP stands for Other Post Employment Benefits. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the acronym. And I've got a fairly detailed uh, recommendation to make um, to the committee as part of uh, this year's budget recommendation. So uh, first two slides are, are, are a little bit of background information, just to level set where we're at. So I'll breeze through these two slides real quickly. So the district has not yet established an OPEB trust fund. Uh, last April, uh, the district engaged the services of Odyssey advisors to prepare an updated GASB 7475 OPEB actuarial valuation to be referenced during um, two critical processes. The first, uh, the 2018 annual budget, and you heard Frank and the folks from Powers and Sullivan reference that actual actuarial va valuation back during their presentation in October. And then the second primary purpose for the updated valuation was in preparation for this recommendation as part of our FY. 2000 FY20 um, budget recommendation. Uh, on May 11th, 
2018, Odyssey completed the updated report with evaluation date of July 1st, 2017 and reporting dates for the fiscal years ending June 30th, 2018 and June 30th, 2019. So typically these uh, valuation reports are good for two years. Um, the district's OPEB liability as of July 1st, 2018 measurement date is 35 million $395,182. The, disc the discount rate that was used by Odyssey Advisors in this, in this valuation uh, was 3.25%, which is pretty much an, ap an ap absolute low point uh, because we don't have um, an active trust fund and we don't have monies invested. Uh, so that, that point, as Frank referenced in his presentation in October, is tied to the S&P municipal 20-year bond index rate. So a little bit of corporate finance here, not much. So the discount rate is the rate used to value the cost of future obligations. So in simple terms, the discount rate is determined by estimating the expected rates of return from investments over the long term. So when you don't have expected rates of re return, you have a low discount rate. So higher discount rates yield lower liabilities. We don't have an investment vehicle yet, so we have really low discount rate. So higher discount rates yield lower liabilities and vice versa. So as I go through the recommendation, keep that in mind. So as we implement and fund a trust fund, our discount rate and the, the valuations will increase by virtue of def the definition. In order to establish an OPEB trust fund, the Regional School Committee must first accept MGL Chapter 32B, Section 20. This is the section of Massachusetts General Law which governs the establishment and activity of OPEB trust funds. According to MGL 32B, Section 20, in a regional school district, appropriations of amounts to an OPEB fund may be made only in the annual budget submitted to the member towns for approval. So there's a, there's a misconception out there that it can, you know, you can do it when you're E&D certified, you can do it when you, if you have money left over at the end of a fiscal year. That's not true. The only time you can do it is during the process that we're in the midst of at the moment. The statute always uh, also references the fact that the treasurer shall be the custodian of the OPEB fund in a regional school district. During the December to, sorry, during the September to December 2018 timeframe, my office conducted a qualifications-based review of four OPEB trust fund advisors with the goal of recommending a, the top-rated advisor to the school committee during this process. During the same time frame, my office worked with Odyssey advisors again to develop, to develop several funding scenarios with the goal of recommending a single funding strategy, strategy to the school committee during the FY20 budget process. So the recommendation. The first point, engage with our top rated firm. So let me back up a step. So uh, Vinny and I, Vinny's in the crowd right there, Vinny Leone, he's our director of accounting and payroll. Vinny and I were the committee that um, evaluated uh, these four advisors and established a number of uh, criteria to evaluate them on. And uh, so we're recommending we engage with our top rated firm <coughs> to serve as the district's OPEB trust fund advisor going forward. Our recommended advisor is Rockland Trust Investment Management Group and I've arranged for them to come to make a presentation to the committee on January 30th. The next element of our recommendation is to accept our 30-year funding strategy proposal that reflects a long-term funding program that will achieve a planned funded ratio of 100%. So that means fully funded by the year 2049. So that's 30 years from now. Funding, it's going to take that, right, given the, the amount of money that we're talking about here. So the fu funding program highlights include the following. So $250,000 in FY20, which is the budget that we're talking about now, increasing by $250,000 per year for the next four years till we reach 1.25 million per year in FY24, and then 1.25 million per year 
until FY49, plus an additional $1.54 million per year beginning in FY37 once, that's 18 years out, once the Essex pension system <coughs> is fully funded. These funds would be reallocated from pension to OPEB. So if you recall the breakdown of our expenses, we have a very substantial expense that we pay annually. It's roughly $900,000 to the Essex Pension Board. So that's the expense that I'm talking about. The actuaries believe that in 18 years from now, that pension will be fully funded and will be contributing at that point $1.54 million a year. And the re my recommendation for OPEB says that once that's fully funded, the money that had historically been allocated to the Essex Pension Fund would, will be reallocated along with $1.25 million every year into the OPEB trust fund. And then the last element of my recommendation is to approve our one-year OPEB funding recommendation of $250,000, which has been incorporated into our FY20 budget recommendation and the numbers that you've seen so far. A couple of additional elements. Um, Develop a school committee OPEB trust fund funding policy that incorporates our proposed 30-year funding strategy as well as our proposed schedule for employer excess payments to be made into the trust fund. This will, uh, the development of a policy will preserve the actions that the committee may possibly take today and make it not so easy for future committees to just change not, what the plan is. Not funded. Right, because it's a 30-year plan. It's not a one-year plan. It's a 30-year plan. That's not to say that they can't change it, but if having a school committee policy in place, in my view, would make that be more, more difficult to do. And then uh, to work with the team at Rockland Trust Investment Management Group to establish our trust fund by June 30th, 2019, which will in include but not be limited to the following. Adopting MGL Chapter 32B, Section 20, establish a formal trust agreement including naming, tr naming trustees if that's what the committee wishes to do and developing inve an investment policy statement that differs from what I just talked about an investment policy statement would be more targeted at what what the asset allocation of the investment would be versus um, how much you're putting into it and then the final element of the recommendation is to deposit our our first employer contribution into the trust fund on or around July 1st, 2019. One of the really great things about Rockland Trust was that they were a full service shop. Um, they're ready to go and we're ready to go and they'll see us through from beginning to end. Um, so the hard work's been done, selecting an advisor and getting these elements in place and um, I think they'll really make it easy for the committee to implement um, whatever, they, whatever it decides to do. So if we, if we flip to the next chart, um, it's a very busy financial schedule um, that is part of the uh, funding scenario analysis that I had asked Odyssey to do for us. And this is the funding scenario that I chose to, to recommend. And the reason being is if you look along the left hand side of the sheet, those are the years. So in FY, starting with FY18, and then going all the way down to uh, FY49, that's kind of the, on the left-hand side of the sheet. If you go over to the first circle at the bottom, if you look at the, I've got my little red clicker here, the first circle, I've circled numbers that are, that are in the 100% range. A lot of us are looking for what page this is on. Yeah, this is the packet thirty-eight. Back and forth. Four. What? No. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Oh, thirty-eight. It's thirty-eight. It's, the wrong way. it's on the screen if you it's want to reference. What you're yeah, yeah. that's not really visible from here. It's thirty-eight. I suggest that as a reference. So this is a funding scenario schedule. And the years, the fiscal years are down the left-hand side of the page. And then the sixth column is funded ratio. And the target, the, our goal was to develop a, a funding strategy that would achieve 100% funding 
and 30 years from now, and then to use that funding strategy as part of our recommendation. So if you look, if you look at the, towards the middle of the page at the bottom, that's the numbers that are circled, you'll see that as we get out to the 30 year point, by implementing the strategy that I talked about, we'll achieve 100% funded ratio. So I'll state the obvious. If we reduce the amount, it takes you longer. It takes you a lot longer and, you're, and you're, you run the risk of your liability growing and your discount rate being less. There's a reason for this. Something, there was a law that changed. There was something that changed that made this a. So this is not required by law, right? No. So this is just, this is good business given the liability. So the accounting standards changed, right? They put, it changed from GASB 44 and 45 to GASB 74 and 75. And basically it took the OPEB liability as a footnote on your financial statements and put it on your balance sheet. So it, for us, for accountants, it made it real. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no law that says that we have to do this. No, I thought it changed something like mm -hmm. uh, bond ratings or some something else when we go to book for things like bonding. Mm, large amounts of money, I thought it made a difference. No, that's fine. I'm not, oh. I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, yeah. I have no idea what I'm talking okay. about. That's right. my problem. Yeah. <clears throat> How much are we spending in our budget this year to cover these other post-employment benefits? So we're in the pay-as-you-go mode, and I believe last year it was 700, and it's the number to the far right. $748,000. So in our budget this year, there's that amount of money to cover the, these costs. Yeah, so a number close to that number, probably, you know, within 10, you know, probably 10% higher than that. I don't, we don't budget it that way. And where does it show up in the whatever nine line items? It, it would show up under healthcare costs. Health, yeah. Health it would insurance. be embedded in the, the cost. Which is in which line? I don't know what you're looking at. Administration, capital, and operations, guidance, and counseling. Fringe, if you're looking at. Yeah, it'd be fringe. But that's not one of the DESE categories. Um, so is that an insurance, retirement, other? Yes. Yes. So the, the problem with the pay as you go, as Frank talked about, um, you've got a growing You've got an existing liability, future liability for current ret retirees, so it's principally associated with health care costs into the future. And you've got what actuarial, actuarial assumptions, which make assumptions around the rate of retirements, the, the pool that will be drawing on our health care benefits, and the, the rapidly increasing rate of health care costs. So that's how you you know, in 30 years from now, you get to a liability of $100 million. And, and without, and so if you think about funding it through the operating budget, like we're doing today, at some point you're gonna, you're gonna break, so we're prop two and a half communities, right? So our, our budget dollars are limited, and as, as this thing accelerates like a giant snowball going down the hill, right, you're not gonna be able to fund the pay as you go, and it's going to accelerate at a really rapid rate. And if you don't begin to invest money to, into some sort of a fund in the future, you're going to really you're squeeze pay the price out. down the road. Or you can just really support single payer health insurance. <laughs> Funded in a whole nother scheme. <laughs> It's called that the long term strategy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little bit of a long <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe a it's a two year strategy. <laughs> <laughs> but these would still be investments made by the school committee that would actually then be, should that ever happen down the line, that so would it, still be available. You still have to, to be us. paying for it. And You'd have to, point, at that point. whatever it is written in the right. trust. You yes, know, the yeah, so, so the, the way the trust is written, and I believe it's required by not law now under the you know, Mass Municipal. Modernization Act. I believe that the language in the trust is explicit in that the funds in the trust can only be used for this purpose. 
And if things were to change substantially down the road, you could always stop contributing, right, right if you didn't need to. But as things currently sit, and as right. our actuaries, who really are really great at what they do, um, are helping us figure out we've got a tremendous liability on our hands, and it's my recommendation that we begin to deal with it in a meaningful way, not the, in a The thing that was confusing way. to me in the actuarial report is that the number of potential drawers was continuously increasing over the time period. And our total number of employees has decreased a little bit, and yet it's projecting like by the time we get to this end here, we're going from like 190 people that we're supporting to 300 and something people that we would be supporting. And I didn't understand why. I mean, there's a lot of talk now about, you know, stagnation of life expectancy and stagnation you know, and like why were we expecting with a stable or even decreasing employment number of employees that we would be 50 percent more employees in 20 years that would be drawing on this well the other one so those would be retirees michelle i'm not exactly retires. sure right Right. right, but why is that increasing year over year over year over year? Because the there's more people different. retiring and people are living longer. Yeah. But retirement plus actually retirement not. plus actually lowered the age of retirement for a lot of teachers. Say uh, that again. Retirement plus actually lowered the retirement age for a, a whole generation of teachers, and so they're actually going to be retiring earlier and be on our health insurance longer. You know, and that. Okay. What's the age of retirement now? Fifty. So uh, well, it depends yeah. on when you got in, and it's, I said, yeah. you know, my whole generation, it's 58, 59. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's, it's six years older than, six years younger than what, yeah. what a lot of the, uh, you know, the generation yeah. before me was Plus, in. It was like, it went from in this year, 194 potential retiree spouses and surviving spouses to 2056. It was going to be 320 people, and that's all based on life expectancy increasing by some dramatic amount? You know, they get to, they get to reach a retirement age earlier, right? And then they live longer. Right. So you have that. And you're carrying them longer. So. Yeah. Sure. That's right. the Seems two factors. So he, I don't know. I didn't understand. It seemed Park, He's odd. laid out all of his assumptions that he's done in a, it's a, I don't know, 80 or 90 page. Right. Actual well, this was on. So it's not, it's not in your packet. 64. I know. I have it right here. <laughs> I no, printed I'm, it off. I'm speaking to your fellow committee members okay. as they look for the material. It's, it was referenced during the audit in October, and it's posted online, and I sent you a link before the holidays. That's the report that Michelle's referencing. It's an 80 or 90 page report, and there's four or five pages of assumptions that the actuaries laid out, and they're generally accepted assumptions. So Jeff, there, there are eight scenarios that Odyssey included in their in their document. So at my request, so those weren't yeah, those no, were things it. that they just did. I you asked said, them okay. to kind of do do it that so way. So can you can you describe why you and Vinny chose scenario seven as opposed to maybe you know, instead of thirty years, thirty five years, or there are a couple other ones that get us to one hundred percent at it, just at thirty nine or tw or twenty nine or thirty years. You know, like why seven? Uh, I chose seven because it achieved that the stated goal and yeah. objective of being 100% funded in 30 years. In 30 years. Yeah. And using the uh, deferred pension funding. So otherwise, if we right. didn't use the deferred pension funding, then yeah. we'd have to take a different strategy. So there was a lot of thought given to this, yeah. right? So I wanted to, for the lack of a better word at the moment, right, m minimize the um, amount of damage in the yeah. FY budget recommendation. Yeah. So I, I appreciate the fact that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars is a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but if I chose a different scenario, it could be a lot more than that, right? Um, yeah. So th that's why, Gene. I, I the goal was to be funded in thirty years, which is a long way away. May I just ask a couple of quick questions? I'm new to this. So as a district, we pay. I thought as a teacher or a district employees, we pay into a mass, 
Mass Teacher Retirement System and we collect benefits through the state. This has nothing to do with the teacher, the pensions. Pension. This is this is principally uh, retiree health care costs looking out into right. the future. Right. So when so when you when when a teacher retires, um, if they are l younger than 65, they can continue on the district's health insurance, you know, paying the the 40 percent like they've been. But the district is still on the hook for the 60 percent for a retiree. And then once they turn 65, we offer a, a Medicaid it's called an, an, enhanced plan. an enhanced plan for Medicaid that then te then those retirees can buy. And again, it's at the same 60 40, 60 40, 60 40 yeah. split. So they're paying, you know, we're still paying 60% of that enhanced plan if they, if they choose to do it. So all of this number is just health care costs? It's, That's it's what it is. Principally health care. It's nothing yeah. to yep. do with teacher retirement. Yeah. Or yeah. You're right. That retirement goes into the state. That sound really good. <laughs> retirement, yeah, they, the eleven percent they take out of your check that goes that goes to the, the state uh, retirement board. So they're dealing with the the pension payments, but as far as health insurance goes, it's still your your hometown district is is the one that's that's you know if they're offering plans, that's what they're doing. So this is a this is an issue that every municipality has, yeah. including regional school districts, because you know we're kind of an autonomous standalone Thanks. municipal unit. Every Every, every entity is you know, dealing with this, right? Because right? they own the liability because it's their employee base. Mm -hmm. And what, when you say fully funded, that means from that point on? What? So, so fully funded in terms of coverage of liability. So if you turn and look at that schedule and you look at my pointer, yep. right there. So right in that zone, I'm saying that if you follow my recommendation in terms of funding, the actuaries say that is, it is highly probable that we will be fully funded, meaning that we'll have enough money in the OPEB trust fund that we had established in FY19 that come FY49, new people sitting around this table, won't have to worry about this because there'll be money in the bank to cover these liabilities that wouldn't otherwise be there. For how? For It'll be forever. Forever. Yeah. yeah. Those numbers are huge, right? Right. I mean, we're not talking about a couple of million bucks here. So the expected liability is around a hundred million dollars for health care costs in, 20, in thirty 20, years 20, from now. Thirty right. years from now. But the interest, right off, now if you if we got to one hundred fourteen million dollars, like it is down in the bottom of column two, the return on that investment would then cover the retiree health health care. Costs. In perpetuity. In perpetuity. That's yeah. the point. And on the bright side, in 2050, there'll be an additional $3 million for the general budget that will be freed up, I guess. Right. Oh, yeah. So, so Unless we had single health care. <laughs> Unless we had single, single payer health care system, in which case it'd be paid by right. somebody this else. a very bleak outlook. <laughs> I'm just trying to add some sort of so, so, Gene, get, to, get back to the question that you kind of prompted me on. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So, so, for example, um, if you look at the baseline scenario and, yep. and the pack that I, yep. you know, um, so just to kind of get a, a baseline, mm -hmm. I said, okay, if we threw 200,000 at this thing right. and we just threw 200,000 at it every year for the next 30 years, yeah. what would we, where would we be at? Yeah, so 11, because 11 5%. Yeah, <laughs> we'd be at, we'd be at a little less than 12% yeah. coverage. <laughs> Uh, and then I ratcheted it up. I said, okay, yep. what if we threw yep. 200 at it uh, in the first year and then increased it by 100,000 a year to a million dollars? Yeah. Um, and then left it at a million dollars and d didn't do anything with the deferred pension funding. So um, in 30 years, you'd be at 50% funding. And then so on and so forth. And you can read through the scenarios yourself. But I chose this scenario as given my stated objective, which was to be at 100% or thereabouts in 30 years. So is the goal of the OPEB to create a fund that has enough principal that it throws off an investment income to cover the cost of the post-employment benefits? Or is it a fund that you then draw down to cover those obligations? So initially, it's what you said first, right? So it's like your, it's like your 401k, Michelle. 
So you're going to pump money into it when you're starting, hopefully when you're 21, and you're going to invest it aggressively because it's a long-term outlook and you know maybe an 80%, 20% mix in terms of stocks and bonds. And then you're going to continue to invest and hopefully increase your investments over your you know primary earning years right into your 40s and your 50s. And then as you reach ret the age of retirement, which would be 2049 in this kind of scenario, that's when you start to draw down on it. But by that time, you've generated enough principal and interest income to cover your future needs into retirement. That's, that's the best analogy I can come up. So this money would actually stay in there. Yeah, you would, so at 2049, oh. right, you might, in this scenario, you might stop, contri start, stop contributing right. and start drawing. It all depends where you are, but that's the, that's the logic, is you invest early, you invest aggressively. fairly aggressively, you stick to your guns so that in the end you have what you need and then you draw on it. So let me ask you a hypothetical. So what happens, so what happens, uh, this doesn't have to do with the actual numbers, sure. right? So uh, in that's the better. case of another recession, right? So. Yeah. Uh, would the committee then sort of reassess no. its no, investment? Stick to your guns. It's a, it's a long term. That's, <laughs> a that's my year, theory, right? It's a 30 year investment it's a, strategy. It's a 30 year long term investment strategy. You don't, tar you don't try to time the market. Right. That's why I'm recommending a po an asset allocation policy. Yeah. So you can't just say, oh no, let's go into cash. Right. Well, but right. the truth of the matter is, this committee cannot obligate any sure. future committee to any budgetary vote that right. is done year after year after year. Right. Right. So, right. so the policy. The policy is, is nothing. The policy no, is just. It would require a discussion. Sure. It would Change require a discussion, but yeah. it the committee, this committee cannot commit any future committee to any budgetary no, that. payment yeah. other than if we were to do a capital something or other. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, I'm not suggesting that you do. I'm suggesting no. you establish a policy. Right, but the liabilities, I mean, the, the, we're looking at $35 million liability that was, didn't happen this year. No, it didn't. Or last year. I mean, no, it happened it over, you know, decades the of time, decades right? So we're, we're essentially being punished because other people didn't pay their price. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> we should solve the problem, I mean, so that other future committees and future districts. Single payer health care system. <laughs> yes. Like I said, I agree, <laughs> but I, I see that as, as a little more of a long-term strategy. <laughs> <laughs> You're much more hopeful for three years. I, I would agree. I, 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 if that happens, I would go for it too. But you know, I'm just saying, there's another solution. Yes, <laughs> I don't doubt that. I disagree. So that's the recommendation. Um, like I said, I've got uh, the folks from Rockland Trust uh, coming in on the 30th to make a presentation to the committee about you know, their operation, their services. Right, right now the budget recommendation includes the first 25,000. 250,000. 250, 250, yeah. 250. Oh, what did I say? 25. 25. 25. Oh, okay. yeah. And then <coughs> the allergies play better. But it well, level it's services, so are we cut finding the savings someplace else? <coughs> so if you, if you go back to the budget recommendation, it's level service plus, plus OPED, plus which is this, okay. plus SRO. That's right, you did say that. Yeah. Okay. So we, we can come back to this in you know, every meeting if, if, if you guys need to as you, as you absorb, uh, absorb the information. There's a lot. It's a lot. But if you're interested in some really light reading, <laughs> uh, that the actuarial, actuarial valuation is uh, online under audit reports. I sent you a link to it. It's mostly there, numbers. There's it's, a lot yeah. to it. Yeah. So the school resource officer, that's, that's only on there as a as a placeholder if to pay for the it, first year no. and then it would be funded later? Is that so the hope? For the, so we, we only appropriate money f one year at a time, right, to Michelle's point. So our recommendation is level service plus $250,000 for OPED plus $73,000 for a school resource officer for FY20, kn knowing that the 
timeline around the host community agreement and the revenue that might be generated by Green Meadows to cover the cost of the SRO might not be there in FY20. Right. So Mike, Mike and I wanted to recommend the right. SRO. So in order to be able to fund it for FY20, we included the full cost in the <coughs> district's budget. Right. Because Green Meadows hasn't paid a dime to Hamilton yet, and they don't really know when they will. Yeah. Hopefully in the future, hopefully a year from now, right. there'll be an SRO, hopefully, and the full, the full cost will be covered by the town of Hamilton and it'll come and we out take of it our out. operating budget. Right. <coughs> okay, so my question is, so I heard what they said. Thank you. And Chief Stevens, and um, talking about it's going to be a Hamilton Town employee. That's mm -hmm. my concern, is if it's a Hamilton Town employee, are we really going to pay that full fee when they're planning on using him as no. an employee? Wait. Well, that's what they were saying, that he's also going to be a Hamilton Town employee, which means, you know, in the extra time, they were talking about... Actually, the answer is yes, in year one we would be. So the but would he work solely for us or also for Town of Hamilton? Then do we recoup some of that money if Hamilton's going to be using him as an employee as well? Recoup from who? From when? Town of Hamilton. It would actually be the if Town he's, of Wenham, If I he's being paid... So, so would this employee work for $79,000 a year or would this employee be making $79,000 a year from their school employment and the town of Hamilton's going to kick in the additional whatever? We'd have to work that out. So I'm just saying that's what... So the recommendation is a placeholder for the fully loaded cost of a police officer for one year. If the committee's in supportive of the recommendation eventually in the process, and we would have to do we it. could we could find <coughs> we could fine tune the numbers right i just um, was curious about what we, they've said we would have to write up a memorandum on the street of, that it's really we a would have to write up in town employee we would have to so it, we would have to write a memorandum of understanding between the district and the town of hamilton that spelled all of that out and that would it, and it would need to answer your question as to how many days that person would be expected to be in the schools and what percentage of the you know total salary that of a police officer you know that would equal out to? I think we'd have to figure that out. Yeah, that's what I would like to know. Just you know, <laughs> get it kind of strained out. Yeah, I mean that's that's all stuff we would have to work out with them. And will one of the duties be traffic duty? Where? <laughs> yeah, what, what day paying. of the week? Yeah, it on Every day. We're already paying. Because we already pay them. Well, no, I know, but yeah. the school resource officer is only one person. Can't do traffic duty <laughs> at six. And do and do right. SRO stuff. Well, he can't be a traffic cop at all locations at once. Yeah, but we only pay time. for one at one location. Which There's one detail officer at the the middle school high school exit. So what about the cop that stands outside of Winthrop every morning? Just Creepy. on his own. Oh. <laughs> That's called. Community policing. Well, thank you to that police officer who walks <laughs> my kids across the street. So is there any more questions for now on OPEP? Okay. Thank you. Next. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Next one. So next up is the uh, We're still going capital. Yeah. Capital projects list. Uh, so why don't I get this started and then hand it over to other folks. Um, so capital improvement project list updated. Uh, so just a quick update on kind of the key assumptions. So coverals, uh, you know, the time frame covers sev several year, years. The scope includes, you know, the things that it has traditionally since I first developed the list uh, four or five years ago. Facilities and grounds, technology, food service, athletics, master plan. Uh, definition is tangible assets that cost at least 10 grand and have a useful life of at least five years. And then funding sources. Um, it's, it is being recommended that four of the capital items totaling $122,186 are funded through the FY20 district's operating budget. Uh, for the remainder of all the projects on the list, <coughs> um, funding sources for FY20 and beyond have not been specifically identified and may include debt exclusions, grants, donations, and the district's operating budget. So if you look at the schedule itself, um, I simply updated the schedule uh, from last year. So there's two FY20 columns. The four items highlighted in green 
totaling $122,000 have been included in the operating budget recommendation. The, the, um, the column to the right also labeled FY20. Uh, the items highlighted in, in orange are the items that were, had been identified in FY19 from the failed debt exclusion request. So those get moved forward a year, just simply move forward a year. And then the additional items in that same column that aren't highlighted were in that column last year. <coughs> um, so I didn't monkey around too much with the list. I did update a couple of the uh, estimates and did add a couple of new projects to the list, and those are noted with a red asterisk. <coughs> So in, in light of the update, um, Mike and I thought it was important for the committee to you know, provide some guidance around you know, prior, prior, prioritization of the projects, um, approach for this year in terms of debt exclusions. In light of our conversation uh, during executive session on uh, December 19th, um, just a committee not want to move forward with some of these other projects pending the outcome of, of um, that, that work. That would be. I know we, we need some direction. All right. That would be my thoughts. I don't know how my committee members feel about it, but. Well, we have a uh, capital planning subcommittee, so, and I know you guys met earlier in the month, so I'm wondering where, why don't we start there? Okay, so um, we, we met, um, well, we had met in the summer and looked at, we're looking at the capital plan, and then we did meet um, last week um, and had a lot of questions. Unfortunately, because we weren't given a lot of notice and couldn't get answers to our questions, it was hard to try and get some of those answers until we got them today. And so, you know, one thing that after looking at last year's failed override, um, the, the working group was looking, taking a fresh look at all the items and to come back with a new recommendation. We did talk about possibly with all these changes plus some new uh, items added, which is the Long Meadow property, et cetera, with all these changes, that it might be a good idea to um, look at or recommending a, a district strategic planning committee, which would include um, community um, members, school committee members, students, admin, and staff to kind of think about a strategic plan of where we want to go and what do we actually need. Because right now, when you're looking at the capital plan, we're kind of all over the place because the Long Meadow property has now come you know, into the picture. If or if not, that moves forward. We're not sure where that's going. As well as then the turf field plan would kind of, if Long Meadow goes through, then turf field has to be redone. And what are we really looking at and need? And um, at the same time, then you've got furniture. Are we going to do an SOI again for, um, you know, if we add a school or whatnot? You know, because I know Cutler did not go through for the SOI. So that's kind of, we just were in the talks. and. You know, we didn't get the information till late, so that's just what we talked about. So it's hard to make a full recommendation, um, just that, you know, based on the short time that we had, plus it being a holiday. Um, all right, so you, you guys met a few times, and you're saying you, you just got information back. Now, we have to understand that this We didn't meet a few times. We were you asked, we were... We were twice. asked at the last meeting to meet, which was then during holiday break. There was no one to answer our questions because both Mike and Jeff were on vacation and the um, answers came back this morning. We could not meet since then other than what we talked about. We do have a meeting scheduled for two weeks from tonight, but right before our school committee meeting. Uh, but that's as far as we've gotten. Yeah, so. <coughs> I mean, I feel like there's a lot of things in place, and I think um, having a str um, some kind of, you know, so things are getting old now of 
we've got so much going, thinking about could change that, you know, putting together a district strategic planning committee where we can get the towns involved of where we're looking at, plus, you know, community members, plus um, school committee, students, admin, staff, and then think about what we really need, and then that way you get buy-in from everybody on a plan. All right, well, so we have a, a list here of, you know, things that we have been identified and discussed as being needed, and we've also discussed that this is a constantly flowing, changing uh, document that's going to keep, keep growing. Act's going to keep growing, and no, no matter what, it's going to keep growing. You know, no matter what pl plan we put in place. <coughs> Excuse me. These yellow items on the list are things that were identified, you know, as a priority last year. Um, you know, first with the working group, and then t at the um, with the whole committee to go forward as a debt exclusion that got turned down. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I mean, I think there, there's definitely enough information on here to at least begin to try and prioritize whether or not, you know, what, what's, what, what needs. Well, I did say something that we decided that, you know, we needed to take a fresh look because what was, you know, it failed last year and it was supposed to be safety access and critical infrastructure and there's some extra things that aren't part of that on this orange highlighted area so those are things that you know trying to be mindful of this budget the budget is even though it's level services it's still at a huge cost especially you know to one town where you've got the shift in enrollment so i'm just saying you know we've got to take a different approach at looking at things and we at we've now added a piece and how does that change looking at some of the stuff on the capital improvement plan because yes it is a you know moving target you know as things happen and come about well and this this plan here is categorized differently than the one last year so they've moved from like like critical infrastructure and stuff like, into like places. So this this yeah. is the original format. Right. This isn't a plan. This is just a list of this projects. Is a list. Right. So how? I, I it's I haven't presented a plan. I haven't presented prioritization. I presented a list for the committee to reevaluate given what happened last year. Right. Oh, so then I have I a question. These green the ones that, that are in the budget, the wastewater treatment plant. That's an annual expense, right? The twenty thousand is annual. I'm recommending it that it is an annual additional capital expense right. that we budget for at least <coughs> until I'm satisfied that the wastewater treatment facility is in a place where we don't have to continuously make investments. So this okay. twenty thousand here is not part of that bill that we sign off on Wetson and Sampson. No. So this is different money. So, for example, this year we had twenty thousand in the budget. We had two effluent pumps, which are critical to mm -hmm. a wastewater yeah. treatment facility fail, and I used the twenty to replace those pumps. Okay. And then the iPads for s the scholarships that would be an annual cost. There's not. I mean, if, if we don't put that money in there, we don't have scholarships for those iPads. Correct. Correct. And then there's this um, refresh refreshing of um, laptops and hardware that's kind of like something you have to do annually because Perfect. stuff yeah. breaks so we really don't have a choice on that well you don't have to do it annually um, well but then you get then you replace you the down right. and you end Your up having a strategy gets yeah, kicked yeah. down the road. Right. so my and recommendation is that we f we fund it annually but th the same is true here with these um, smart board projectors this is kind of like an annual cost and it looks like we're even anticipating doubling that cost in the next couple of years mm -hmm. once all the equipment's been replaced then we'll s we'll stop and reevaluate right and so that won't happen until but again two so these are out. these are recommendations and the, these are Right, but my that we can decide point is these aren't very much, no. especially where we have several of these other items on here that also seem to be annualized, co annual costs. Um, there's a um, this four-year cycle iPad refresh. It looks like it would be an annualized cost, but we're 
putting it over in this like bond category. Um, we've got this $15,000 for whatever an auto scrubber is. We've got it's a floor machine. You know, so if you think about where we were yeah. five years ago, we didn't have any of this stuff built into our operating budget, which created the issue, right? Because we had limitations on how much we could build into our operating budget request, right? right? So when I first developed the, the capital plan project list, I had to include things like re replacement computers and other, the other things that you mentioned because we weren't budgeting. There wasn't space for it in the baseline operating budget already, right. right? So it needs to be funded and considered in a different way because of that. Otherwise, you're going to get year after year after year operating budget increases of six, seven, eight percent, which wasn't what we wanted to do. And that is because if this if this annualized, if we replace these, um, so if I'm looking at the first tech thing. The classroom hardware, laptop, iPads. If we replace them with a bond for forty-two thousand dollars this year, it still says the plan that we have to replace another set for eighty-four thousand the next year. So that either has to be in a new bond or in the operating right. budget. That's what that's what it says. Right. For that particular item. So Can I you feel that some of these should move out of this yellow category and some of them should find their way into the operating budget. And that's what I feel too. That's what we talked about, that they should be um, during Not the all summer. Of them, we but some of them. Yeah, there were a couple yeah. items that we had um, put out on the list. So um, we have a 6.2% budget recommendation. Yep. If we put these things into the operating budget, it's only going to go it's up unless go up. you take things out. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. And also, would like a better explanation of what the uh, building energy management systems is. Because um, thought it was from a grant. I know you replied, but just maybe you can give us a better explanation of what this cost is for 375. What does? Well, I think what, I responded to you today. What was yes. the response what was, to what? Can you explain? Because not everybody got that. But to really talk, can you please explain what the building energy management system? So why it's a cost and not part of the green grant. Energy grant. So that $375,000 is for additional work, okay. controls, and HVAC work at the high school, middle school complex that was not covered by the current Green Communities Grant. That's the that's additional work that would need to be done to complete. The and project. that's new, right, to this five-year capital plan. Yeah, that's uh, what the star means. Updated, it's an updated item based on updated estimates that I just received from the engineering firm and the GC. <coughs> and so are we in jeopardy of losing the grant if we don't do this work? No, 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 no. No, no. no the, 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 the original grant is being completed. Okay. This is additional work that wasn't covered under the original grant. Okay. So you said you actually discussed this in your meeting and you had some stuff that you thought should be moved into the operating budget. So I'm curious what, what you guys discussed and should be moved. Um, the, like the sinks, countertops, and water bubblers um, we um, thought should appear in the um, regular budget and not, um, and we thought actually that it was already replaced but um, Jeff answered that it was not um, that that wasn't part of it, um, but feel that that was part of a regular budget item, and um, furniture. We felt that this should um, be held because we don't know what's happening at the schools. We need to, you know, really have furniture some. Furniture can be moved into new schools, though. I mean, but but even, we don't even know if what's going. But. Line. You know, we may school. have, you know, but that's still a lot of money right now. We've got huge expenses. And um, it's just, we're not sure if the, um, we're going to go down to two, you know, two elementaries. Are we staying at three? And um, and then, um, da, 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 da. Well, I, I can probably venture a guess that in, should we actually build a new school in 10 years, we'll probably need to replace oh, any gosh. existing furniture we ha already have. <coughs> including anything that is on this list. 
that's that's a decade from now. Well, right now our budget's at 6.1 percent, and we were not recommending that to go for a debt exclusion when it failed last year, and so that's what so, we so discussed as are, well are as. We, um, are You're you asking me for my what we I'll, talked I'll, about, but you keep interrupting and I'm saying your opinion. There are two sides of the court. I'm asking what you guys discussed about what should be pulled out of. We were t I'm discussing we didn't that. We really um, finalize a whole lot. Um, we we, uh, had some um, we were recommending that, that this it was supposed to be safety, access, and critical infrastructure, and there were other items that were weren't in these categories as we see it. Um, Repairs of the sidewalk at the middle uh, Miles River Middle School. Repair of the sidewalk and curbing at administration those building. Are, those are trip, trip, ha trip hazards. Yeah, That's why they're a safety issue. That, that, but they don't. Let, I mean, why would you want to bond something that's gonna, you know, still have to be replaced? It should be in the regular budget. And then also, um, the repair of the gymnasium floor should be under maintenance. And then I saw that, you know, we ha knew that. You know, iPads, Chromebooks, smart boards, and classroom hardware refresh should be under technology budget. So, so if you're suggesting that you move uh, these into the operating budget, I mean, we're going to be at ten percent. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and you're already concerned about increasing the inc the increases in the operating budget. Right. How do you propose to resolve that? We didn't. Well, we had well, uh, at the end of two so and a half hours. So what we were talking uh, about we was that this is why we were talking about having um, that we have a new meeting. talked about a, um, you know, district strategic plan to see what we really need to do to get buy-in from the towns. We couldn't get it passed as a debt exclusion last year, and I just don't see at a six point one plus a debt exclusion happening this year. Because right now it's so high, and then the um, with the enrollment shift, too, right. to Wenham, and they just had an increase. They're get, and then they're also going to have a budget. We just need to be mindful of you know what is going on in our towns as well as our schools. And I do want a high education. I want things to be nice. And right now we've got so much on the table. We're not sure that new things came like Long Meadow has come into the picture to see what we're doing. Right, which is really why we need, we need some direction in where to go with this from the capital improvement. And that's what we didn't have enough time, and so next time I would like, <coughs> it would be nice if our group, working group could get have heads up notice, because we ended up having to meet on December break, because all of a sudden we're asked for this information the last Wednesday meeting we had without any prior notice at all. And so we had to do it during December break. And, you know, so you're taking vacation time from, you know, the working group to try and make a recommendation. We still had questions and we didn't, you know, get answers till today because Mike and Jeff were on vacation. So we can't have a recommendation so quick with no information. It would be great to have a heads up notice because obviously Jeff knew about this ahead of time. He could have gave us a heads up ahead of time. Yeah, but I, I don't think it's entirely fair to put it on Jeff or Mike because the working group is our, is the committee's working group. I know, but right? we were so supposed to have a recommendation. You couldn't give us a heads up notice before Wednesday's meeting? It was the subcommittee's stated charge, charge yeah. that you would I have know, to do I know, but we met. I'm giving you. You, you met in the summer. <laughs> I'm sorry. We've met twice. No, in the last you six haven't months. been here. I haven't I mean, missed a meeting yes, you in have. a year. Yes, you have. That's I haven't crazy. missed a meeting that, in that, half. That, that oh my God. To do with anything. So, what exactly is the question before us tonight? Because, quite frankly, I do agree with them. I thought it was a huge surprise to be said, hey, in two weeks, come back with a recommendation on something that you were just handed at a meeting and it's going to be over Christmas break. I agree with that. But, what is the question we're trying to resolve here? what they were recommending to be in the capital. Okay, so they don't have a recommendation. So now what are we going to do? Okay. So <laughs> going ahead as a committee, we have to actually look at what we would want to prioritize either to move to a debt exclusion or to uh, try to move into the operating budget without Yo. Or push it off. I would say you're not going to be able to do a debt exclusion because you're already going to have an operational override with the current budget you have, and there's no way you're going to get that passed. You're no way you're going to get an operational, operational op override and 
a just won't debt pass. exclusion. It just won't pass. It didn't pass last year, and it ain't going to pass again. People will Plus, not Wenham's vote for two. Wenham's going to have an override as well, so <laughs> it's just you're dividing of what's going to pass and what's not. If you had a partner in the towns that we could talk about timing of overrides and, and capital expenses and stuff like that, we might be able to talk about this, but right now we don't have that going on. So, but what, it, what needs to come out of this committee is one, belief in our budget, in whatever our exclusion is, to be able to go out to the public and actually say why we believe that this is what we, what's best for the communities and why it should be voted for, which I think we failed at doing and why this override didn't pass last year. Secondly, it's up to us and let's to see. actually prioritize this list talk about to them. then be able to go out to the community and say, here's our priority list, and then move at that point. So it starts Exactly, so that's right. right. Then I let's start talking about it. today, so we couldn't make a recommendation. I got them this morning. We couldn't post but another but meeting. There's nothing in this information that has changed since last April. I, I beg to differ. There is an added 500,000 approximately from last year's operating override. So don't say that. And there's four new, let's see, there's several things either updated or new on here. Okay. Oh, I mean, there's, and again, so let's stop arguing provided. about what is and is not on the list and get to it something happens. that's actionable. So if what we have to do is go through this list and decide if it's a priority, then let's just go down the list. Instead of talking about who did what and who shot John, and it's getting late and it's very frustrating because there's no resolution to opinion. <laughs> if, if you want to get to a decision, then we need to start moving in the direction that's going to make a decision. So that's to discuss, is $375,000 something we think goes into the budget, goes on an override? Or do we even think we want an override? Well, I mean, that's got entirely to do with whether or not the, the other project we've got going actually goes anywhere. Great. Because then tonight, the vote has to be no, because that is not knowable. Exactly. That's... So, kind of so, so I move that we vote to not have a debt exclusion for FY20. There's second. something that's actionable. Wait a second. No, no, no. No, 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 no. So, um, well, we'd have to have to keep voting on the motion. You have to discuss because, it. I, I would right, say, because if I anything, would say that, that, that would have to be specified that would, that, in capital improvement. Yeah, I was going to say that, that motion was so broad that that would Great, then let's get to something anything. that's actionable. We're talking, we still have the budget to go through. We're talking, it's after 10 o'clock. <laughs> What's the plan to get to something that's actionable? <coughs> so at this point, you got a motion the, to second on the floor. Right, we have a motion that has been seconded that we need to vote on. The motion was the no override, the broad sweeping statement. No debt exclusion. No, no debt, debt exclusion. exclusion. No debt exclusion. For the fiscal year 2020 budget. We that would include what, what we talked about last right. week. Right, I understand. Yeah, that's why I said so it's, I'm it's, sure it's very broad. That, that, that this motion is very broad. <clears throat> would you like for me to, add, based on the capital list in front of us? So if it's not sure if it's seconded, do we have Somebody has to move to amend it. I would move to amend that we limit our not going to the debt to those items on this capital list in yellow in FY20. Second. Okay. Making sure that's right. It's not on yellow. In yellow. That's you got it. I don't know what issue nope. you're trying to get around, so I no, can't. We just, sure to no, you got it. Make sure that we think you, I think you got it. <laughs> Uh, all those in favor? That's to, uh, to amend it. To amend it? Yep. Oh, to amend it, yeah. Okay. All right, now on the original motion that we think that we're, it's now yep. just the capital. It's just the, just the stuff in yellow. That's what it was. That we would not take the stuff in yellow to a debt. To a debt exclusion. That's what Correct. the motion was. You can take the stuff in white, I guess. But. All right, all those in favor? All those opposed? Okay. Four to three. Did not pass. 
So now you have to figure out what's going to go on the debt exclusion. Well, no, we don't. No, we have to figure <laughs> out whatever we want to do. Okay. We just left the option open. Right. Yeah. <coughs> so in my, in my discussions with the Hamilton side, I think there are a couple of things. I think we need to figure out why it was initially rejected, right? So a couple of things that I heard were that it was um, certainly the overall cost was a factor. Another thing was that they didn't quite exactly understand some of the items, right? Um, and, and then the third probably would be that they felt that there wasn't, related to the second one, a real prioritization of what the items were or why we were putting forth all this stuff, right? And I mentioned to them that there's even more things on the list that didn't make it that, uh, and so what we put forth in terms of uh, IT, critical infrastructure and security was already a window list of a longer list of items. So um, I explained further that some of the items that they wa that we wanted were um, were necessary and critical and had value. Uh, and when I explained a little bit more about that, they, at least the folks, few folks that I talked to, they, they kind of agreed, right? So, um, so I, I would say that, you know, if you were to put forth a list or a uh, group of items for a deck exclusion, it just would be the same set of things from last time, which is IT need critical infrastructure and security, safety and security. Um, you know, there's required things on this list. ADA requires things, you know, we gotta do that. So there are things, you know, we heard many times in the past from many parents and, and the two chiefs about um, safety in the schools. And there are cl clearly key items on this list that directly address those, I those things. And I keep pointing out, you know, if you if your whole network goes down, you're dead in the water. You cannot function. Totally. So agree. I don't think totally there is agree. any any particular disagreement in um, why we need the generator. Why we need well, <laughs> why we need these items, right? So uh, one strategy, I'm not saying this is the way we go, is that we make it sort of a la carte, that we go forward with um, uh, with three warrants, one for just the tech items, one for the critical infrastructure items, hmm. and one for the safety and security items. That's an idea. Let That's the a voters good idea. choose and yep. explain it that way. It's more of a pain in the butt, well, but okay. I'm well, talking those strategy, those how to get forward, how to get these things right. moved forward. I think so. Else two, two, two th I'm sorry. Can, I'm you sorry. Say the, um, can you say the breakdown again? Oh, it's right there. The categories, where? Where? Uh, tech, no. uh, critical infrastructure, Sorry. and uh, oh, safety and security. Other, that's the old stuff. That's the other. So, um, so those other there's two categories. There was a it's different, different, yeah, different list. You said uh, safety and security, uh, IT, and critical infrastructure. No, so this is different. But no, no, no. So it's like the same. Li wait, wait. It's the same list. Yeah. Is categorized differently. Yeah. That's right. the only thing that's right. different. Yeah. So yeah. The categorization of this first column. Right? Yep. Yep. It's different, but this, it's the same list. Right. No, I understand, but so where are you putting um, furniture then? Because that's not technology, it's not critical, and it's not safety necessarily. It was critical. It was Would critical. You? It was under critical last year. So, because if you remember, we had Brian come in and actually talk about how they were, mm -hmm. they had all the broken um, chairs. Chairs, and they had to put together a classroom with leftover stuff, mismatched furniture. And they've been. Brian Manigoni? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Eric. Tracy. Eric, Eric, Eric Tracy? Eric. Okay, that's what. And they've but been. So then, yeah. but it was Eric Tracy, down, and they've, they've maybe been. Maybe that needs to be broken down too of where it's going so people know. So where it's, it's all going. high school. Does 800,000 all high I school? I know. Is it all high school? It was not. It's just so what the, the it's way it was explained, it was a placeholder number at about $415 a unit. It's 2,000 units. 2,000 units. $400 unit. a unit, which is kind of in the. But it's for all the schools. It's, it's district not just wide. the high just, school. That would be though. district wide. District wide. And what's a unit? <laughs> a desk would be a unit. A yeah. chair would be a unit. So, it's so we, we would need more desks and chairs than we have students? It is two, it, it's no, a placeholder for 2,000 so. units at 400 bucks. I know, but if we have less than 2,000 students and we have to buy 2,000 units. Well, you need a desk. Yeah, a desk and a chair. Desk and, a chair. Oh. And, it's, and it's an average. It's a okay. two it is a placeholder. So, you know, some of the high school, high school desks and chairs cost more than 400. 
I like elementary may be less pick if they're not going to like all of it because I know there were some complaints about for instance one well, item not, or when two I talk about a car I'm not yeah. talking about each individual yeah item. you're talking about a like, grouping. that's ridiculous I know I I'm, no that I that's that what I'm is saying is um, technology critical and safety those are the three yeah. different items yeah. that it's going to go separately yes I, that's what I'm saying I like that yeah I'm not saying I'm not saying that's the best strategy because I actually don't think it wrong, necessarily but is. But the whole point yeah. of but I'm saying that is a strategy. Was that it wouldn't that might have a winning. It might be a way to win. Right. Win the minds of the voters. Put it to or the voters. I'll, 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 the I'll minds you, of the voters. I will tell you right now that I would love to actually move. Why don't we? Terminator. Uh, why don't we? Before we go through this whole list, why don't, why don't we resurrect the list from last year and <laughs> go from there? Yeah, I'd like to see how that the list, and so that way we've got those three separate categories. Okay. So how are we resurrecting that list? I have them. You <laughs> have it? Okay. Yeah. It's the next, probably next thing we'll go through the list again. It, I, but I also want to bear in mind, so right, go this moving forward, that we're doing this, but the other thing that we need to really be thinking about is Longmeadow and that it's right. on, that it is in play now and what we're going to be presenting at that point because I, I think that is something that, while isn't on this list, it is... is Capital. It is on that list. Is it? It it's is on this list. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, it's over only, there. I'm only looking at it. It's got a red star. star. Hey, hey, hey. It's, it's on there. It's on page two. It's 2023. Yeah. I mean, so it's well, a it's huge, it's a huge ass, but it's Again, something Again, it's a placeholder. Right. And, it, and it's in play, and it's only in play for a limited time. And, you know, do we want to put it out to the community? And then we have to temper our expectations well, that's, with that in mind also. Right. That's why I mean, that's why I thought we were coming in April. You know, if that's going to the April town meeting, then you want to do that's a debt exclusion. We have no that's idea. Also the recommendation well, that's that why I'm saying that. Forward. That's why we need that. Stacy's not look, in charge of the long meadow thing. The cap, it's a capital improvement. They are not in charge of that. We're, I'm not in charge of the long meadow and those discussions. It's, it's Mike and Jeff. I think and both the decisions <laughs> are. I think these two simultaneous it's projects capital. are going forward but equally in we it's going not forward. About it's not what we talked about at the meeting. We're doing that. So we need to, that needs to be communication. They're, they're, yeah. They're talking about yes, but if they yes. come back with a number. But we need to decide that it's going to be a but priority, a capital session. priority of the school. But community. then that's why I was saying no <laughs> debt <laughs> because I was saying the long meadow and you know, that's a, Big issue. We can't throw all of it to the no, you know, taxpayers because we talked about having that for but April. We, yes, we did, but we also can't drop this list as we work on Long Meadow. It's got to be simultaneous. So why don't I send? Why don't and I send? Figure out as a committee what we're going to put forward. So, so I will recirculate the, re the list from last the year. Recategorize <laughs> the recategorized list. And, move this uh -huh. and you guys can talk about it at your next meeting. And Thank you. Um, do That'll you work. still have a copy of the nice thing that the nice poster that you sent out from the post office? Do you still have that? Yeah, Somewhere, I yeah. Because I'd really guess. love a new. David copy. made it. Yeah. I would <laughs> really forward. love a new copy. Yeah. It's, it's really no, nice. No, uh, the exact one you sent out from last year. I've got some. Did. I have an early morning meeting, so I just. Okay. This is getting. I would late. love a copy. All right. So the next really next step on the agenda is adopting the tentative. Yep. Twenty you budget. Do, why don't you keep it right through? When are we going to, uh, are we going to have a workshop on, like we did last year, get more in depth on the budget? Mm -hmm. That was so the plan. What is that plan for? Not yet. We were talking about it. We'll talk about it on Monday about what the schedule was. I mean, we had, we had offered yeah, to I do know. another one. Yeah. We should talk about it. Oh, we will talk about it? Oh we should. <laughs> Yeah. I thought you said we did. No, no, we should. That. I threw it out there. We, yeah, we, we did throw it out there. Uh, so what we're looking at is page 44. Mike, want to go back one slide? Yep. Real quick. So here, here's our financial statement on the, um, the net assessment financial statement on the, bud the current budget recommendation. Um, so as you can see, the... The general operating expenses uh, after offsets are increasing by 6.19 percent, and the um, the net assessment in total is increasing by a little over 1.4 million dollars. So the regional agreement requires the committee uh, adopt a tentative budget 
not less than 30 days prior to the date on which the committee adopts its final budget. So that date's February 13th. So our next meeting's on January 16th. So, so because of the language in the regional agreement, we're the committee's required to adopt a budget tonight. A tentative budget. A tentative budget tonight, because it's not less than 30 days prior to the date on which the committee adopts its final budget for, ins for the ensuing fiscal year. But the committee. This, but this budget will change and can change. Yes, absolutely, tentative. tentative. There's no hold right. on this whatsoever. Perfect. The committee shall annually, it's what we do every year. That's right. what I Because thought. of the language in the regional agreement. Right. It's not a, it's not a statutory requirement. Right. It's simply if you want to do this differently, regional change the regional agreement. Yes. <laughs> what you should do. The committee shall <laughs> annually prepare a tentative operating the books. and maintenance budget, including therein provision for any installment of principal and interest to become due in such year in any bonds, notes, or other evidence of indebtedness of the district. So I've typed up a motion for the tentative FY20 <coughs> operating budget vote um, with the numbers as presented for someone to read, if they would like to do that. The Hamilton Wyndham Regional School Pit Committee approves the tentative fiscal year total general fund expenditures budget of $34,268,132. This amount includes general fund operating expenses after offsets in the amount of $33,869,760 and general fund debt service expenses in the amount of $398,372. Furthermore, the gross operating expenses of the district before offsets have been allocated to the DESI <coughs> defined accounts according to the summary by DESI category include chart included in this budget presentation. I, I just want to note that uh, fiscal year 2020, she uh, happened to skip over the date. Right. Yeah. What happened? She skipped over the date. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Second. Jimmy seconded it. So all those in favor? Okay. Opposed? Thing up is approving the seal of biliteracy diploma endorsement. This is a technicality and yep. something that we just sort of realized. We yeah, this was Kevin Sano presented on this in the spring, and if we're there was a question about whether we should have the school committee approve it to put it on the diplomas. So let's do it. I move that the Hamilton Wyndham Regional School Committee approve the seal of biliteracy diploma endorsement as um, stated in Exhibit D. Second. All those in favor? Okay. And we have a, one donation. Okay. And it's from Looters and Environment. Environmental Landscaping for $50. Move to approve this. I move that we, uh, Hamilton Wenham Regional School Committee approve the Looters Environmental Landscaping donation of fifty dollars. Second. All those in favor. All right. The topics for next meeting. And then we'll get it. Um, what do we get? What are we looking at? We got a couple things for as far as budget topics. We're going to talk about the uh, uh, project financing for the Winthrop Sprinkler project, and it's Hilltop Security. Yeah, I get hit. I get the folks from Hilltop Securities coming in. Okay. And Don. We, we are scheduled to have our first public hearing on the budget, so we'll advertise that a week in advance and then open the floor up for anybody who wants to come and talk about it. Uh, capital Projects Prioritization is on there. And can you send that for the working group? So yep. We'll get them I got a list. I'm going to send it out to everybody. If you can send that to the working group. In the what? For the working group, so we can. Yeah, um, I was going to send it to everybody tomorrow. Uh, and then the summary of administrator requests not included in the FY20 budget. And then that's the budget items. Are we going to have a workshop? We have to, I have to talk about that with the chair. We had initially sort of circled the date, but um, we haven't really confirmed it. It'll be, it would be tentatively. I have the date. Yeah, it's so January 23rd. You're making a request and walking out at the same time. 
I've got an early meeting. Yep. I have. So don't I. Uh, yeah, 23rd is what we had. All right, I'll discuss that on Monday. Yeah, let's, let's talk other? about it. Actually, right. privilege. So I want to move to adjourn. I move to adjourn the Hamilton Winter Regional School Committee meeting of January 2nd at 10 22. Second. All those in favor? Woo!